Okay. All righty. We're ready. I'm going to start. Okay. I would like to call to order the meeting, uh, the regular board meeting of the Chico Unified School District Board of Trustees. It is August 19th, 2020. And I would like to report out that we were in closed session prior to starting this meeting. We had uh, one decision that was made. The board unanimously voted to ratify a settlement agreement to resolve a special education due process complaint filed against the district. Pursuant to the agreement, the district will establish a comp compensatory compensatory, excuse me, education fund in the amount of $28,250 for use by student for educational services. Additionally, the district will provide reimbursement for attorney fees related to OAH case number 2020050662 in the total sum of $10,000. Under the express terms of the agreement, the board's ratification of agreement does not constitute an admission of liability by the district. Okay, that was the only item that was uh, voted on in closed session. If you would, please rise and join me in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United, of the States, United of States of America and to the republic for which it stands, which one nation one under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, as we start the meeting, I would like to ask everyone present to please look at your cell phone and silence it so that we don't hear phones going off in the middle of our meeting. Okay, and um, before we actually begin discussing items on our agenda, I want to make sure everyone is clear about the process that we are going to be using during today's meeting. Because of the COVID situation, we do have some special rules that are in place. And uh, prior to the meeting, a Google survey sign up was opened up to members of the public up until 30 minutes prior to the meeting. And we took names for people who were then put on a speaker list. So we have those. Um, those people will be allowed uh, to speak. Uh, when it is time for speakers to address the board, their name will be called and the microphone on their Zoom account will be activated. Speakers should rename their Zoom profile names to match the name on their speaker's cards to expedite this process. After the comment has been given, the microphone for that speaker's Zoom profile will be muted. Anyone wishing to address the board on an agenda item may do so. Individual speakers will be limited to three minutes. Total input on any one subject or slash agenda item will be limited to 10 minutes However, the board may extend that period at its discretion. Comments on an agenda item will be taken when the agenda item is discussed by the board. Spe speaker priority will be given to those who have submitted a speaker's card. If there is still time remaining within the designate, designated time allotted, then the board will provide an opportunity for members attending the Zoom meeting to raise their hand and speak for a maximum of three minutes. Speaker priority will be given to speakers who have not yet addressed the board. If time remains within the designated time allotment, then a public participant may speak more than once. And it has instructions to please use Alt plus Y to utilize the raise lower hand feature, option plus Y on a Mac. In case of numerous requests to address the same item, the board may select representatives to speak on each side of the item. Another uh, very important uh, rule that needs to be 
uh, understood is that when we have an item that is a item from the floor item, only items that are not on the current agenda can be brought up. During those items from the floor, the board is required to strictly listen. They cannot ask questions. They cannot participate in an interaction with the person who is speaking. So that must be kept in mind. OK. With that said, we will go ahead and have announcements. Anyone have an announcement? Yes, Dr. Kaiser. So uh, I wanted to let the public know that today, the League of Women Voters of Butte County started a census phone bank. Uh, they will be calling every number that they've been given by the census to uh, acknowledge whether that person has already done the census, uh, still hasn't done it, I encourage them to do it, um, and those that information will be turned into the census uh, people working in Butte County. The concern is rather large. Right now, the state of California is over 60% in census response, but Butte County is in the 50 percentile. And um, the amount of time that uh, was originally given because of the COVID uh, pandemic uh, extended into October has now been taken back to the end of September. There is a court case on this issue, but we feel very, very strongly that we need to encourage everyone to do the census. This is not a citizenship question. Uh, there is no information that goes to any legal agency other than how many humans were here in Butte County on April the 1st. So um, this is worth $10,000 a head over the 10 years in federal and state money um, and also in political representation. So again, the legal women voters, they're not census takers. They're just going to be calling to encourage people, find out if they've already done it, um, and then get that information to the census people. Uh, that may allow then uh, them to not knock on your door. So started today, and hopefully everybody will get a call and say, I already did it. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, do any others have any announcements? I do not. OK, I see none. So we will move to the next item, which is items from the floor. Uh, we did not receive any speaker cards for the period for uh, items from the floor. So uh, we would go ahead and enable people to raise their hands if they are uh, viewing this via Zoom. If you would like to make a comment on an item that is not on the current agenda. Do our IT people or uh, people who are tracking this see any hands? Matt Tennis, will you please raise your hand on the Zoom? Also, James Bishop and Amanda Moncado, and we will unmute you. Um, excuse me, but let me just mention one thing. Item number 8.1.1, .1, which has to do with our schools opening for the 2020-2021 school year is an item on the agenda. So any comments that are, have to be made with regards to that, it will be appropriate to make those comments when that agenda item is discussed. Likewise, item 8.1.2 about the school waiver is an item that is on our current agenda. So if there are any comments to be made about that item, that is appropriate to be made when that item is discussed when it comes up. So if any of those people, I noticed that the names um, are the same for those people that are on the speaker cards. 
So please keep in mind that if your comments do not pertain to an item that is not on that agenda, uh, that comment will not be allowed at this time. Thank you. So just a note, um, I jumped the gun there and I asked those folks to raise their hand there for later in the agenda. So um, just be patient um, and we will get to you later. Oh, okay. So those people did not raise their hands no, for the... No, they, they did. They, they're for later in the agenda. I'm sorry. And I asked them to raise their hands so they could come to the front of the, uh, the oh. queue. Okay. And we're going to just put them off until the right time of the meeting. I okay. apologize. Great. Okay. Then we will look forward to hearing from them a little later on. Okay. So we will come up to our next item, which is a negotiations update. And that would be Mr. Hanlon. Okay, so we have reached agreement um, with both employee groups, CUTA and CSEA, um, for the startup for the school year. This was focused on the issue of online education. Um, we will be meeting, um, we have scheduled meetings with CUTA uh, for, uh, it is September 10th, and then again on the 23rd to talk about the hybrid schedule that will be coming up as we move into stage two. So, um, like I said, we have reached agreement with both groups. Uh, the final um, 610 process for CSEA is being taken care of now, but the MOU is in effect, so um, things are running smoothly. Uh, good, constructive negotiations. Great. Okay, so uh, I was just wondering, so when is the next date, did you say? Uh, with CUTA, it's September 10th. Um, we have not set up our next meeting time with CSEA. Um, okay. We had just finished meeting with them literally on, um, everything came into effect on August 17th, just a few days ago, so we have not set up new dates for them yet. So you will actually be meeting with them before our next meeting? That is our hope. We will be with CTA for sure, and we hope to with CSEA. Alrighty, and uh, you will be moving forward with talking about the next phase and what that might look like as far as uh, our the teachers and our, and our uh, uh, negotiations with yes regards that to is that. correct and hopefully okay. we'll have um, something to report at that point too okay great all righty thank you Jim uh, our next item is going to be our consent calendar uh, yes dr. Kaiser I wish to pull 3.4 Liz I would like to pull 3.1 Okay. Are there any others that would like to be pulled? Okay. Uh, with that being said, do I have a motion for the remainder of the consent calendar? I move the consent calendar with the exception of 3.1 and 3.4. I'll second that motion. Okay. I have a motion by Dr. Kaiser, a second by uh, Eileen Robinson. This is for all items except 3.1 and 3.4. We will take a roll call vote. Um, Linda Hovey, what is your vote? Hovey, aye. Lando? Lando, aye. Kaiser? Kaiser, aye. Griffin, aye. Robinson, aye. That passes unanimously. Okay, we'll go back to item 3.1. Linda? All righty. Um, this I pulled, it's the account payable warrants. And I had pulled this because I had had a couple of questions that were previously answered regarding two warrants written to NorCal pump and well drilling. And I just wanted to follow up. I don't know if Ms. Kissel is with us today or if Mr. Baltima can answer this question, but I know the uh, well at Nord Country School um, just didn't, it died. And so we needed to repair that well. Um, when we were discussing this, we had talked about getting some reimbursement from several different sources. And I'm curious, if we have gotten any reimbursement for this or if we are anticipating any, because it's over $180,000. Anyone? Uh, Julie, are you available online? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes uh, you are correct. We are pursuing state funding in, in two different uh, groups of state funding. One is the State Facilities Program Rehabilitation Funds, which is a 60-40 split. So we would get 60% reimbursement from the state 
That one, I'm pretty sure that we will be getting. We are also pursuing a grant from the State Water Board, and that's a 100% grant. However, um, they don't have the funding available to, to the agency right now. So that could be a long time coming. Okay. Well, thank you for that clarification. I was just curious if we were still pursuing it. I was pretty sure we were, but I wanted to check the status. So thank you. And if there's no other discussion with that, I'd like to move approval of 3.1. I'll second that. <laughs> okay. Just because I know it's gonna, what kind of vote it's gonna be, uh, I'm gonna abstain from this vote just for the record. Oh, well, that's good, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tom, I didn't hear what you said. Just letting you know that I will be abstaining from the record. So when you hear a bunch of eyes, count, oh, it, is, I count see. it as four, okay. not five. I see. Okay, well, in that case, we're going to do a roll call vote. So um, this is just for item 3.1, and we'll roll okay. call this. Linda, how do you vote? Covey, aye. Okay, Kaiser. Kaiser, aye. Griffin, aye. Robinson, aye. Okay, so that passes with four and Lando one abstention abstain. by Mr. Lando. Um, next up is uh, 3.4, Dr. Kaiser. Yes. I uh, had the privilege of going with uh, Julie Kissel and uh, Maria today to the Emma Wilson uh, Elementary School new construction project. Um, it's really sad that we've done such an incredible job in constructing new facilities and because of the pandemic and the shutdown, almost none of us have gotten to see them. So I felt very strongly that I should go. And it's amazing building. Um, there is a room at one end that's for labeled consultation, but it's really to provide special additional space for special ed. And I met with the speech teacher who had helped uh, my grandson and then um, there's two kindergarten classrooms, just beautiful, gorgeous, very large rooms, new furniture, and then uh, and storage space. And then there's a TK room, uh, again, uh, with uh, quite a bit of storage space. Um, it's just, uh, for somebody who always had to get a chair out for the kid to wash their hands, it's just impressive that these are actually at kindergarten level and the kids don't have any problems uh, using them. So uh, beautiful facilities, really, really looking forward to when we can have the kids in those rooms. And with that, um, I move uh, four point, no, 3.4. I'll second that motion. All righty, we have a motion by Dr. Kaiser. We have a second by Eileen Robinson. This is item 3.4 uh, because we took a roll last time and it's changed again we will take a roll call again so uh, Linda how do you vote on this Avi aye okay Mr. Lando Lando aye Dr. Kaiser aye with enthusiasm Griffin aye <laughs> Robinson aye okay that passes unanimously yeah that's a beautiful beautiful school site with the improvements yeah. all right so we have a uh, finish the consent calendar and our next item of business is going to be uh, item number eight which is um, a discussion action item it has to do with the 2020-2021 school year opening under the COVID restrictions and this will be a presentation by our educational services team yes um, madam president I believe on the agenda uh, 811 is an information only item. Not yes. An informa okay. It is. You, it is. There is nothing that we are going to yeah. be voting on with this you have item. You said a action, and I, I just was. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Yes. This is um, strictly uh, for us to gain information about um, how things went, how things are going. We turn. Thank you again, President Griffin. We're gonna kind of go over what um, led us to um, our stage one opening with, uh, to the COVID response for school, and then we will be sharing some of the things that have been going on the last three days on our school. Okay. First, 
If I can get uh, Mr. Boltema to explain on slide number one. Sure. Um, we ordered very early in the process um, large amounts of uh, personal protective equipment, face masks, um, face shields, and um, most, almost all that had been delivered early enough that on the Friday before school started, we had created a Google Doc um, that all school sites were able to put in their requests, and we provided all of that inf uh, material on Friday. Um, we were delayed in our plexiglass or our sneeze barriers as those were back ordered, um, but I am happy to report that all of the sneeze barriers, all 700, should be delivered this week. So those are just rolling out in the next few days. Um, we er ordered early all the no-touch thermometers, and those were distributed as well. Um, and the only delay, we had reported earlier that we had the sanitizing um, stations uh, in every classroom. Actually, the vendor was delayed in getting those for five of our schools, mm -hmm. but we did still provide hand um, <coughs> sanitizer uh, as individual units. And as soon as those dispensers are available, we'll be installing those. But all the rest of the schools had those. Um, I will say our custodial staff did a really nice job of having the schools, I think, clean and disinfected and ready for uh, teachers coming back. It's amazing what schools look like when we don't have kids on them. <laughs> and I will say our nutrition service staff just did a stellar job at the end of last year and have just continued that. Um, really, they, according to Vince, said it's the best opening they've had as a team. Very positive, excited to see kids and continue to provide a lot of meals at the sites that we've already mentioned here. Kevin, I don't know how many people realize that they can get meals for their kids at the school sites, and yes, it was very positive. Yeah. I had a question about that. Could we just answer a question real quick? Uh, so there's, are there, there's a total of eight sites that they can get their meals at, and do they have to present some sort of identification or a number or anything? No, they do not. And do they have to go to the to the site that they're going to school or can they go to other sites? No, they can come to any of those sites. Okay, all righty. Yeah. You could kidnap a kid and get a free lunch. That would be <laughs> okay. Well, at the same time, I just want to mention the board, there have been some challenges and we're still working those out. Uh, one of the issues is, although we delivered a lot of the items to school sites, um, getting those from an office location out to every teacher and every uh, support staff location hasn't been seamless, I'll just say that. And then also just the restocking. Um, mm -hmm. So we're starting that process of how do we uh, allow the school sites to communicate into our mm -hmm. warehouse area and get those delivered on a timely basis. So that is still, we're communicating and trying to get that a little more seamless as we go. Um, and then the other piece is just with our classified staff, a lot of those, uh, and I'll use bus drivers as an example, we're not transporting students right now. So according to the um, memorandum of understanding we negotiated with our classified group, a lot of those people are still supporting and working on our schools in just different capacities. So we very much appreciate their flexibility, but we're working through those schedules and working with staff so that they feel comfortable um, and still providing a service that's a benefit to our schools overall. Yeah, how do they determine how much food to make when it's gonna be changeable like that? Well, um, they do uh, kind of take a look at the trends. Uh, the meals right now are, uh, uh, bag meals, so we're not serving hot meals. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of flexibility in our ability to put those together in a very quick and timely mm -hmm. basis. Mm -hmm. And again, I'll give our nut nutrition service uh, leadership some credit. They've gone out and looked for other items that are in a um, individually wrapped that are a little more exciting to eat and providing opportunities to kids. So it's really just the ability to be flexible um, and put together more meals as needed as more kids come into those spaces. So. They've really set up a good system to do it, and they're able to meet the need right now. Wow, that's really amazing. Mm -hmm. All right, the next slide is uh, workday child supervision. Before I hand it off to uh, Tina King, I want to be able to thank all the hard people that really worked hard to get this done. Um, Tina King, Ted Sullivan, Callan Kwok, who's our after-school program coordinator, worked extensively also with Barbara Akamoto. Um, the great job that uh, Jim Hanlon and David Cole and Kevin did with getting this ESCA um, agreement done in order to have this happen. They spent many hours making sure that we had our students, um, our staff students uh, placed at different sites. So it, it was an unbelievable thing to watch over a five period um, day and all the questions that they had to handle. So I, I can't thank them enough that to make sure uh, for them to know how much we appreciate that. Okay, Tina. 
Thank you, Jay. Good evening. The Workday Child Supervision came into play to support our staff as they were all coming back to sites to work. Uh, it, it will grow, and I will talk about that in a moment. We do have several successes. As Jay mentioned, we had a lot of people working in a five-day period to make this happen starting this past Monday. So it was a big effort, but it was incredibly uh, exciting as well. Successes, we do have 15 sites across our districts uh, providing the Workday Child Supervision Program. In total, there are 254 students and slash families, some are siblings, uh, being served. All the sites are following the social distance guidelines. We have included some photos for you to see how the setup at a couple of our sites. You will notice that one picture does have two siblings sitting together. We did encourage, even if ages were a little different, we do encourage the siblings to be together to um, limit the amount of people uh, in that, in that uh, group or pod, as we call it, per social guidelines. And we have been working with our Chico Unified Nurses who have been amazing with health guidelines as well as the Butte County Public Health and following their guidelines to address health concerns and the protocols that come to play. Uh, I've been learning a lot about the protocols on a very hands-on basis. I've been very impressed with the direction that the nurses and public health have, have put together over the summer and to see it in play and working is uh, pretty exciting. The challenges are we are going to move this on, ensuring access for foster and homeless youth as well as uh, other at-risk youth in our community that need a safe place to be during mm -hmm. the day. Mm -hmm. We also will be growing supervision for essential workers of our community for their children that also need a, a spot to be at. Uh, I do want to point out this is not in instruction as far as these are not teachers that are working in this program. They are CSCA members from our own Chico Unified who are uh, providing supervision to the students. So the students typically will come in. There's a set schedule that uh, the team has put together, a daily schedule of um, events that happen, basically, and schoolwork is done. Students uh, are there with their Chromebooks and working on their schoolwork, and then it will move into um, lunch, a break, all very much following and adhering to the social distancing guidelines and safety. Uh, one of the biggest pieces, uh, it's been understanding the Senate Bill 98 regulations with this. This uh, last spring when, when we uh, went into the COVID pandemic and our sites were closed, the governor at that time said even though sites are closed, schools can uh, provide and should provide supervision. Again, this is different than school and it's, it's a very difficult thing to understand because it's, it's kind of twofold. So really getting the word out of what that is, uh, Senate Bill 98 followed up with his, reg his, his request last spring, and it is in that trailer bill that uh, s districts like us who receive money for our ACES program, our after-school programs, can ha waive uh, the hour times and able to uh, offer supervision for kids. So that's where this was really born from. Uh, it has helped our workers from our own, our own Chico Unified get back to work and we'll continue to grow it. Yes, Kathy. So uh, I know that a number of the emails that we uh, received from parents, they would self-identify as uh, somebody in the household being an essential worker. So how does uh, a family that has one or two uh, parents acting as essential workers, how do they connect with this? Last Friday, uh, when Superintendent Staley put out her, her weekly update, there was a link in there under child care. There was a section that talked about, uh, I forget the title of it right now, I can't think of what it was, but it was talking about child care needing, needing child care or supervision during the workday. And there was a link in there. We do have about 35 people from the community that have access to that and uh, we'll be talking with them as, as we get this going. The numbers are still kind of morphing and changing as, as Families find out what is working for them. A lot of our older kids, uh, with, when parents thought they might be involved in this program, um, that didn't quite work out the way that they all thought. So there are things that are, are morphing this week, and we knew that. So once the numbers get a little more solidified on that end, and we know what we have, because we have a limited amount of space, right. again, in order to follow the safety guidelines, we want to make sure we have that space to get those numbers. But um, I am pleased to say the community members are responding and our targeted case managers and our foster youth liaison will be working with our foster and homeless families to make sure they understand what uh, this, this offering is and how they can participate. 
So this is no affront to Kelly's weekly whatever, but I'm concerned that some of these parents uh, feeling under great duress might not have looked at that. They're looking for some flashing yellow light that says, you know, come here or stop and read. So I didn't know, uh, and you know, I don't know what we do if somebody's, if the caseload uh, exceeds our capacity, but I know that we have a lot of healthcare workers and uh, people, you know, in critical areas that uh, I think when we had to close down totally, we had at least one family where both people were medical. And so, you know, it just Absolutely. became really, really difficult. We'll continue to look for ways to get that out. And to answer the question about the, uh, if we exceed the number that we have space for, because we're very tight with that right. number, right. we um, will create a waiting list. I did think about that. Okay. Because again, those numbers, they change and flow. And uh, we've already put some kids in with different wait things at different sites. No, so a I, wait list would be offered. I think that's wonderful. And I think this is something in my interaction with members of the community they have the least understanding about. So the more clarification we could, that would be really helpful. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, so Tina, the ages of the, this is available too, what are, what are the ages? They're school age children, so TK through 12th grade. Oh, all the way from TK. We okay, don't have a lot. We don't have a lot of TK, and we don't have a lot of twelfth grade. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> that is the range. Huh. Okay, but it is. It does start at that, though. Yes. And and when you talk about essential workers, uh, I guess most of us think of you know the medical workers or what, even the grocery workers, even the. What about uh, teachers from other districts that don't have this? I think most people who are working outside of their home, who have to work outside of their home, would be considered essential workers. I talked to a gentleman who is a mechanic who, mm -hmm. who is uh, waiting yeah. as we open this up, and I would consider that an essential worker. So when talking with people with that very question, how do you determine that, working outside of your home, if, you're, if you have to do that, in, in my eyes and uh, others, would mean essential workers in that regard as far as care. I know that is, it, um, it's hard to quantify essential because they're, you know, we, we all work and work is important, but it's that leaving the house piece, I think. Right. On right. that note, yes. a radical idea for increasing the amount of space we have in this program. We've talked about granting some leeway for teachers who are working on site. I would certainly ask that we consider looking at that leeway as quickly as we can and potentially allowing some of those teachers who have school aged children to begin working from home if we think they can handle it. That both opens up space and it meets what many teachers see as a need for that. One other thing to add to this is um, we just ordered um, earbuds with mics for all these programs for their schools. So as you can see, if kids are working on their classworks mm -hmm. in these roads and they're working with different teachers, it could get a little um, distracted. Uh, so we ordered those for that and plus we ordered enough for ha to have 200 on each school site for our elementaries just in case we have families with multiple students and they need support with those because if they're working in their house on multiple Chromebooks and they're all talking, we want to make sure that we can provide for those if they cannot. So we ordered those. We ordered 3,600 of them today and again, I want to have a shout out to Marcus French. He's done an amazing job in our purchasing department finding these things for us. So they should be in within a week. Okay, and one last question, Tina. I, I forgot to ask this one. So what is the time? When is this supervision available? So it's 7.30 to 2.45. Okay, well, I'm glad that we had the opportunity to hear about this in greater depth because I think we heard a little bit about it, but it wasn't, you know, right. it wasn't real solid at that point. So thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to call on John Vincent here on the Zoom, but this the, the technology slide, again, that's another important piece, obviously, if you're going to go to online learning and how everything was rolled out. So I'm going to kind of have him talk about um, his successes and challenges that he had with our technology. John? Good evening. Um, yes, I, um, well, I want to talk a little bit first about our Comcast. So we found out that Comcast has a new program um, that offers, you know, they offer two months for free under normal circumstances for families that qualify for this Internet Essential program. But what they offer now is the ability for the school district to cover um, the additional four months to get six months of free for those families. And so it's a great opportunity for our families who don't have the ability to pay for Comcast 
to get down to that program, be able to have six months of free internet access um, from their home. Uh, so we signed that contract um, today and sent that off, and we're just now waiting for the codes to come in for those families. Um, John, that's phenomenal. That's great. Oh. Something that's really neat about this program that is that it covers all the families that are in our 40% or higher schools, which is almost all of our schools. So all of those families qualify. The one thing that doesn't qualify is if you've had Comcast some anytime in the last 90 days. So if you've had Comcast in the last three months, you don't qualify. But other than that, you do. And um, they even have a debt forgiveness, an amnesty program, too. So if you have outstanding debt with Comcast, um, they will forgive that. Um, so that you can get on the internet essentials and get your kids online using that. Um, we also um, have, we had 146 T-Mobile hotspots um, that were part of a grant that we were working on in the spring uh, through the CDE. Uh, the CDE was not able to get those two weeks before school ended, but it worked out okay because we have those now. And so we also purchased an additional 100 of those T-Mobile hotspots. Um, T-Mobile was, uh, normally when you have a hotspot, you you get so much data on it and then it throttles down and you can't really use it anymore after 10 gigs or 25 gigs, it, it gets really slow. But these are actually truly unlimited. Um, and so these are set aside for those families that we have that are not in the Comcast service area and they're our most needy families. So we're trying to hold back those 246 um, hotspots for those who just who cannot get the Comcast deal. And so um, we actually will be, um, Chris Winkle has been working with the um, targeted case managers, um, and they, we will be sending out the first batch of those hotspots to our school sites tomorrow. Um, as far as our teacher laptops go, um, we purchased 800 HP, their X360 laptops. What those are is a, it's a, a Windows laptop that flips over into a tablet, so allows our teachers to write on that and be able to have that display in Zoom for our kids on the screen. Uh, those were ordered back in July, July 31st. Uh, we're hoping those will come in sometime in mid, late September. Right now, supply lines are really delayed, so it's taking a long time for things to come in. Um, in the meantime, though, we ordered some webcams, 800 webcams, and those actually were, um, those were in stock, and so those should arrive hopefully in two weeks. They're supposed to ship on August 28th, and then our teachers then use those in their, their desktop machines that they currently have and be able to utilize that with their desktops to be able to do Zoom. I know they're having issues right now with Chromebooks trying to run Zoom meetings, so this should resolve that problem. Mm. Um, another big thing that happened too is we had 350 ViewSonic touchscreen TVs um, that come in with an embedded Windows 10 PC in them that arrived on Monday. So those are in stock. They're in our warehouse. They're at the Computer to Classrooms warehouse, and they're being just distributed to school sites You know, as we speak this week. Um, the installation of those starts uh, this weekend. Um, the, the contractor estimates he can do 30 to 40 of those per week. So we will be seeing those going out starting this weekend and getting installed in our classrooms. Um, this has really been a team effort on this. Um, Phil Morgan in the facilities department has taken lead on this. Um, computers are classrooms. They were, using, uh, were utilizing their warehouse space. Um, nutrition services, um, they brought their trucks over and used those to be able to distribute the TVs to the school sites that our bus drivers put together the carts, um, um, our warehouse staff, and um, have all been working together with IT to make this happen as quickly as possible. And so I'm just really excited to see these TVs going into our classrooms starting this weekend. Um, on the challenges side, um, probably the biggest challenge we have is getting internet access to those outlying areas that we have. Um, some of those can be serviced with our T-Mobile hotspots. Um, we also have a lot of um, the, the Comcast hotspots that were open last year are still available. So um, when families come into town or go someplace where there's Comcast, they can log into a Comcast open hotspot and be able to utilize that. Um, we also are, of course, our school parking lots. Um, and then something that came that really will help our, our families up in Cohasset and in Forest Ranch is that um, there's Wi-Fi available at their high-speed Wi-Fi at the, um, the Cohasset Community Center. And then the Forest Ranch Charter School. So both of those locations have Wi-Fi that our families can hook onto and be able to utilize. And then the last thing on our list here is um, the programs, implementing new programs. I gotta say there's a slew of new programs and the programs that are expanding during this time um, that need to be attached to our current system. So um, things like um, keyboarding without tears, 
uh, Pear Deck, Screencastify, um, Zoom. So Zoom, we, we had free licenses, those expire September 1st. And so we purchased education licenses for that. So we're working with Zoom right now to get those integrated in using a program called Clever. Um, and then um, I, I gotta mention too, so like working with Zoom, they are just really swamped right now. Their support department, so it's been a challenge getting support on some of these programs. So I know our, it's it's hard for our staff to wait on some of these. They're working hard to try to get these in place as quickly as they can. Uh, but these these programs are really swamped. And that kind of brings up another one too, Ingenuity. So Ingenuity was one of those programs. It's a, one of our curriculum programs that had issues with trying to integrate into our systems. And we've been working with them for a week trying to get that resolved. And finally today, uh, Tim Karras was able to get through and, and get an engineer on the phone and work with Michael Ruffner and be able to get that resolved today. So big kudos out to Tim Karras and Michael Ruffner for taking care of that and getting this online with that. So um, all of our systems worked well. We didn't have any big outages or anything when school started. So um, things look really good this year. Any thank questions you. on the tech? No, but thank you. That's a tremendous effort. That's, thank you. Thank you guys. I'd just like to add on most of those, um, the laptops and the ViewSonics and everything that we've been purchasing um, has been through the CARES Act dollars. Am I correct on that, Mr. Boltima? I just want to say as a grandparent who's been observing the interaction with watching a kid start second grade or kindergarten, that um, there's a lot of effort being put in by the teachers and the family members to get this moving and smoothing it out. So uh, I multiple teachers go, well, I'm just making a mistake or we're just getting to this part or whatever. But that's normal. And I just think we have to really give each other the space to um, let learning happen at all levels because this is a learning process. So thank you, John. OK, the question again to Mr. Bultima was? Well, there, um, we'll talk about this a little bit in the budget update, but um, as a reminder, uh, we did receive one-time CARES Act dollars, and the cash is coming. We may not actually have the cash in the door yet, uh, but we have the apportionment uh, schedules and letters. So we have about $7.3 million that we have to spend right now with the deadline of December 31st of 2020. And um, that needs to be learning loss mitigation offset. Those dollars have to be used in that vein. But the things that were described here are being paid out of those dollars um, so that we can make sure that we provide what's needed for students, what's needed for educators, uh, and we have the resources to do that. So we're very fortunate that we have good reserves because we're able to do that now and then expect to be uh, paid in September for those, those um, CARE Act dollars. Right. So um, I had a question. Uh, just to back up a little bit before you start talking about Oak Ridge, so if parents are having difficulties with technology, how, okay, you have a parent tech line. Um, what about like, I know you, you can't have your teachers in contact with tech people all the time. We don't have enough tech people, I don't think, for them to be. How is, how are, how is that being handled? I know on the, when I was on with my grandson, the sound for the teacher's voice got all weird and vibrating like <laughs> it was really strange and uh it went on for a while and i don't know what happened to fix it but it did get fixed and i just wondered how did that happen was there somebody there who came or did, how do you fix those things that are happening right in the middle of a, a lesson that's a great question um, right now we have four hour tech aids on every campus but they're also working the hotlines so we know that we have people overseeing them um, that, to support them, so we have a parent line and also a staff line. So a lot of times so they quickly, so they're just one number off, um, two seven one five and two seven one six. So th we've had a lot of support coming. Uh, people have been asking for that support, and we've been able to very good just because we learned our um, not. I don't want to say learned our lesson, but we knew that the support that we needed coming back from March and April when people were having all the problems. So our tech people were ready and they had schedules and who's running those hotlines all day. And I think that's really helped um, our families and our teachers get the information that they needed to make sure. Also, some uh, those la new laptops we'll be getting, the new HP laptops will be much more effective in the Zoom for our teachers that they'll improve over the Chromebooks that they are using now. And we, we will. We are looking forward to having those and to get them done. Okay, thank you. I'd like thank to mention you. too, if I could. Um, 
our, our IA computer folks who do the, the parent line, the parent support line, they took 215 calls on Monday um, in a four hour, the four hour block. So they did a fantastic job of helping our parents and, and helping our kids to resolve some of their issues. So great job that they did. Yeah, one last question for you, uh, John. Who are the people on the web crew? What is that? The people on the web crew to, to, to help manage the, the network? I, I'm just looking at all these people's pictures oh, up here uh, on our John, screen. Uh, John Benson, I can answer that. So that is a screenshot, all approved, a screenshot of students welcoming the sixth grade class at Marsh. So they spent a couple of days welcoming those sixth graders in, just trying to make them feel as comfortable as possible. So you see some, some zany teachers and some eighth grade leaders and some incoming sixth graders. Oh, okay. Thank you. Another great thing is what this actually looks like is Miss um, Staley and I, Mike and John and Ted, um, were able to go into some classrooms that were on the first few days. Uh, the teachers um, sent their Zoom links to us. It was unbelievable. We watched high schools, which had 38 uh, students in them. We watched um, junior highs that had 34 and 36 students in them. And then the most enjoyable ones are the kindergarten classes <laughs> that we were watching. I saw an 18 um, classroom, and I believe we watched another one with 24. And yeah. it's amazing work that our teachers are doing. And the kids, it's unbelievable how they're ready to go with their headsets on and, and how active they were. So we, we, another thing was, which was really good about it, we didn't just say start the curriculum. So most of those first few days that we've had is more of the SEL, the social emotional stuff, mm -hmm. getting to know the students, how was your summer, what's the favorite things? And our teachers did a fabulous job all the way through K through 12 on having those conversations with their students. Yeah, I'll jump in. It was a real treat to be able to see our teachers in action and see the students engaging and how they really reached out to get the students engaged. So kudos to all of our teachers, as always. So next, we just want to make a couple of quick notes about Oak Bridge. This is not the way we wanted to increase their enrollment. However, <laughs> it has shot from roughly 100 last year to over 600 this year. With multiple platforms, the elementary platform has shifted from Oak Bridge packets to an Acellus, more rigorous uh, online platform. And obviously with that kind of growth, we need to look at hiring and voluntarily transferring teachers over to Oak Bridge. So the HR department's been working hard to be sure that people feel comfortable shifting to that, uh, to that environment. We are in the process right now at Oak Bridge of hiring some registrar, counselor, and targeted case manager uh, support. Those roles have been filled in various ways by staff with the smaller numbers that we've had, and now there'll be more concrete uh, responsibilities for folks that we're going to be hiring. And there is always a silver lining in these kinds of situations, and after talking with Rhonda Odlum, the, uh, the administrator of Oak Bridge, she's appreciating a larger focus on CTE and AP coursework. That hasn't been a major focus for Oak Bridge in the past, and it is a silver lining as a result of the increase in enrollment. As a result of the, the increased staffing, of course, we're going to have to try to find some places for those folks to fit. So our m and department and our own Patrick Bassetti are working on technology drops and making sure the furniture is socially distanced and they're, uh, they're where they need to be. And as you're going to hear, I think, in the elementary and secondary slides, you know, with this kind of significantly swift shift to a different learning platform, there's always going to be some professional development learning curve. So just like general ed, like the other schools, our, our, um, our teachers that moved over are quickly learning how to, how to manage Edgenuity and Acellus and all the things that come with being an Oak Bridge teacher. I can again thank um, the workers that we had over at Oak Bridge. Rhonda Olam, who took over last year, she was a point two administrator. Now she is a uh -huh. full-time administrator over there and getting all our teachers trained in such a quick manner, also with the help of Rachel Love, helping them teach the ingenuity um, curriculum to them. It was an amazing transition that, that they were ready to go on the first day of school from going again um, up to about 100 last year to about 600 this year. And so they've done a wonderful job of getting that ready. So I really wanted to thank them publicly. All right, next is going to be the elementary curriculum. Mr. Sullivan will talk about that. Yeah, great, thank you. We're, we're happy to be back. Uh, a lot of excited faces on that first day via Zoom. Um, some of the things that I heard nice compliments about from a mix of folks, uh, as Kelly and Jay shared, we got a chance to Zoom in with a bunch of classes. They returned and you could just feel, teachers are just thrilled to be reconnecting with their students and, and doing it via Zoom. I know they'd rather be doing it in person, 
but there was just a real positive ambiance as they were connecting with their students again and having a nice, solid interaction. And as Jay shared too, really the first couple days are all about reconnecting, building some relationships, um, helping students feel welcome back again with those kinds of things like that. So that was just an, a great experience to watch those things happening. Uh, I heard lots of comments from parents. They're just very appreciative of that things are very organized as their sense. They appreciate having a daily schedule. They really feel like they kind of know what's happening and what to expect for their child this year. So teachers did a really good job helping organize all that, put that together for it, and be able to share that with families as well. Uh, we, we did a big push, as Jay said, we, we had a lot of PD going on, and Mr. Shepard acknowledged it also. We had a lot of PD the weeks right before also. Um, so we did everything from a lot of curriculum overview and practice with it to really zooming through, like, what does your online day look like as a teacher and as a student? So we had several days worth of PD that was available to people walking through all those kind of components. And I want to throw a shout out also, we had four teachers that really did a lot to help us organize. It was Christy Bankson, Carol Sylvester, Stephanie Kniff, and Sarah Pardini were real instrumental in helping organize those PD sessions and put them out for staff to walk through with all those things. So lots of comments from teachers in particular also. Um, just very appreciative. I think a lot of them said it, it was really hard to wrap their brain around what does it look like? You know, 8.30 on Monday when I log in to have that first Zoom session, what is that actually going to look like? And they really did a good job walking through and kind of like this is how your day is going to look as you do these things. So they really walked them through the life of a teacher in a Zoom world with those kinds of things from opening to instructing to uh, work with student work time with those kinds of things also with it. So did a great job. We really talked a lot. It, it sounds funny, but it's almost like everybody is a first year teacher all over mm -hmm. again right now. Yeah, I heard that comment. So it's, it's just a whole different world and a lot of people that are very veteran, experienced, fabulous teachers are really nervous in ways that they've never been nervous before and feeling uncomfortable around it. So we just talked about, I think you said it, Kathy, or giving yourself permission that you, this is new to all of us and we're walking through it together, not just the students, but the staff is all walking through it together also and, and they're feeling it, but they're excited to be back and excited to be trying it out and kind of getting, getting going with it also at that point. Some of the things that have come up, uh, and, and this is no different than when they're there in person either, but uh, student stamina, the first couple days back, and in particular five, six-year-olds coming mm -hmm. back, Mm -hmm. and trying to have stamina. It's just a different kind of stamina now of being able to be in Zoom or in and out of Zoom and spending time in that world is a different kind of stamina with it. I know kids are always pretty gassed the first couple weeks when they come back anyway, but it's just a little different version of that and just kind of us adjusting to how do we respond to that and recognize it and what do we do with it also with those kinds of things. Uh, Mr. Vincent uh, acknowledged one of the other things that has kind of perked up a little bit some issues with Zoom and the Chromebooks and kind of some of the sound quality that you talked mm -hmm. about um, with some of those things. But like as Jay mentioned, the feedback we got was that the, um, the earbuds would help immensely. So we've already ordered a whole bunch of those to have those accessible. And I know John Vincent's already got a Zoom upgrade in process for us with it also that'll work much better when we get the actual new laptops in place with it as well. So hopefully in the near future, we'll have those areas addressed also. So we're not getting that kind of fuzzy in and out mm -hmm. conversation with it. Um, one of the other, yes. I also was surprised, but I guess I shouldn't have been, that in uh, my grandson's classroom, there were students that weren't with their parents in their family homes. They were with other relatives or they were in transition or didn't have their Chromebooks yet. So they were, we were hearing them. I mean, they were there, but they weren't on the equipment. Hmm. And then there were also, I don't know about you, but issues with dealing with the Chromebooks. Um, was not smooth, but um, everybody I, that I interacted with was um, giving themselves permission and the kids permission. We just would keep on going, we keep on working, and you know, it, that was positive, very positive. Good. Forgive me if uh, I need a refresher here. For those five and six year old kids, how long are we asking them to be on Zoom at a stretch? So we have, uh, we have three hours set aside, Tom, but, and, and I say that loosely because we're still having conversations. Does that mean that we want students to be on Zoom for three solid hours? Absolutely not. We kind of told teachers, give yourselves permission, give the students permission. If you're six years old and you're doing some introduction things for 10 or 15 minutes, it's okay to stop and let them take a break for a while and say, come on back in 45 minutes or whatever that may be. And that's just back to that, everybody's a first year teacher again and what's reasonable and how long can kids, you know, what, what's a reasonable amount of time to do those things? And I think everybody's kind of 
testing the waters and getting a sense of how that works and what's reasonable and how long can we do those kinds of things also. So teachers have some flexibility to Absolutely. Make those calls. Absolutely. I've kind of referenced it, Tom. You know, when you're in your classroom, you're not up having a full long conversation for three solid hours with students. There's a mix of instructional time, there's a mix of independent work time, there's a mix of small group work support happening, there's a mix of recess time and breaks built into that. So really we want to see that same kind of mix happening during that three hours of synchronous instruction. So definitely, I wouldn't want to be on Zoom for three solid hours no. with somebody. No. So we have the same expectation for our students and staff also to kind no. of mix those things in yeah. place. I hear you about stamina, about students returning, but I think, and that language just concerns me a little bit because we certainly don't, I think it is different and we don't want to be mm -hmm. training our students to be staring at screens for even nope. an hour at a time. Thank I don't you very think much there's for any desire. Well, yeah, let me just chime in here a little bit because I've been doing this for the last few days <laughs> and I, I'm kind of an expert at it now. Um, you know, I have a kindergartner and uh, it, uh, he starts at uh, 8.30 in the morning and he has a half hour lesson mm -hmm. and that incorporates singing, it incorporates body movement. You know, he's not just sitting there looking at something. Um, they're singing songs, they're drawing pictures, they're getting up and moving, um, they're having books and everything. And then he takes a break mm -hmm. for an hour and then he comes, he actually comes back at 10 o'clock and then he has another session for a half hour. And then um, after that, uh, the teacher gives an, uh, some work to be done and he does that afterwards. But it doesn't take very long for him to do that work on his right. own probably takes them, you know, 15 minutes at mm -hmm. the most. So, and that's a, that's a really good balance because, um, you know, when he sits there, um, especially, you know, early in the morning, I mean, you know, those kids and I'm looking at all their pictures on the screen, you know, they're yawning and they're, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're just kind of waking up and, yep. you know, and, and so the teacher, you know, kind of goes with the flow and she's very good at, you know, uh, giving them as much as they need to keep them occupied, but not overloading them. And being very clear about what the expectations are and, you know, this is what we do and this is how this works. Um, and, and so I, I've been really impressed yeah. with, uh, with the, um, the way it's been done and, and just really surprised because there are 24 kids. <laughs> there are 24 kids that are participating in this and she's able to go to all of them and contact, you know, make, you know, verbal contact with them and have them show pictures and do different things. So um, I'm really surprised because I've been in kindergarten classrooms and I've worked in <laughs> kindergarten classrooms and I've been, you know, with uh, various programs for first five yep. where I've dealt a lot with kindergartners and I know what kindergarten teachers have to do. And uh, most of them have all these numerous stations and kids are moving around to the stations all the time. And you never are having to keep their attention for that long a mm -hmm. period of time. And so seeing how they were able to um, move from different things, you know, kind of like moving from different stations, even though they were in one place, was, was really uh, pretty fantastic. So um, I have to, you know, give my... Uh, kudos to them because uh, I think they are doing a great job and you know if, if it looks like that in the other classrooms and I'm sure it does um, you know as far as this building student stamina I think just coming back from a break you know everybody is going to yep. be like you know I need to build my stamina <laughs> you Absolutely. know with doing this well, so, isn't it the parents that are the ones that are <laughs> continuing that continuing what the parents are the ones that are having to continue with what's going on outside of the timing that the teachers are putting in. Right. Well, I mean, it's like, you know, it's a from when the when you get done at 1030, the child is expected to continue doing something afterwards. So for a kindergartner, 15 minutes of so-called homework is about as much as, you know, they're expected to do, which is appropriate. But what you're describing, Liz, is exactly what we hope to see happening. Kind of that mix of different experiences for them, so it's not three hours of just straight Zoom time. Right, and you know, a lot of the criticisms that have been voiced are, oh, these kids are sitting in front of desks or mm -hmm. sitting in front of computers for six hours straight, and that was never the intention, and that was 
never the plan and that certainly is no not. but they are expected to keep their computers on for three hours at a time to meet the time allotted teacher and just to sum up i have absolute faith that in our teachers i just want to make sure that we're giving them the leeway yep. they need and, and they're they, professionals and they're good at their job yep they definitely have latitude to zoom in and out and do those kinds of things also just like what you're talking about so last thing on there uh, it, it's a compliment to our staff again I think the most questions I've received from elementary teachers is they're worried about what kind of assessments we want to give to start worrying about reading groups in particular. So actually our district leadership council group is going to start meeting this Friday and that's our first topic is to start going through those things so we can start sharing information with staff of you know here's what we think would be a priority and here's what we think may be reasonable to be doing on Zoom with looking at reading skills and how you can focus on those kinds of things and how to provide some instruction. Mm -hmm. And then are you also professional development as Mr. Shepard Mention has already come up a whole bunch also. So we're gonna be looking for feedback from DLC to talk about what kinds of things can we be providing more support for you so you mm -hmm. feel more comfortable kind of doing those things in the online world like mm -hmm. that also. And Do you know, uh, it, it was mentioned about, you know, um, and this, this is a concern is uh, parents are expected, or whoever is uh, going to be working with the child is, is going to have to oversee, you know. And, and I can understand where you know, certain parents who may not have the background in, in that, and I'm wondering how we can support parents better with that. Uh, you know, uh, I was part of this Parents as Teachers program, and that really focused on, on preschoolers and parents of preschoolers and kindergartners learning that they are the ones that are the first teachers in their child's lives. And, uh, and so this would carry that even further with how do you help parents uh, parents do the same kind of things that teachers do as far as helping to motivate children, helping to keep them on track, um, those type of things. So I would hope that we would provide, you know, in the future maybe investigate if parents are having difficulty with that, how can we support them better? I think um, exactly what we did with our EL lessons last year with our TCMs connecting with families helping them get on Zoom, helping them talk about what does it look like being a good student with their child. I think we could certainly roll that over and start providing some of those kinds of supports to non-EL students also with our T TCMs and being provide that for them. Yeah. Okay, John, can we go over secondary, please? Yep. Okay, just wanna go through some successes here and as we have been discussing you know, the shift happened relatively quickly, yet there are always things that are encourage, encouraging as we're coming out of these. And one of the most beneficial uh, processes we d developed over the summer was trying to get as much teacher, counselor, psychologist, admin input into our process and our planning as we could. And those meetings are continuing. Um, we know we have district leadership council in place. However, over the summer, with so many folks doing so many different things, we needed to try to encourage an even wider band of input. So we were able to do that. And as I said, those meetings are ongoing. Most of our classes have aligned with Edgenuity. Obviously, not all of them will because we have such a rich range of, of classes available in the, at the secondary level. So we're working with other platforms, UC Scout, um, ICVE for CTE, so just ensuring that we may not align something perfectly, but we are trying to match it the best we can. And as was mentioned before, you know, coming into this school year, regardless of how we started, we knew we were gonna have to spend some time getting students and staff and parents back into the swing of things mm -hmm. more than we've ever had before. And I think it's not just the, the spring, summer, early fall, conundrum, but it's also going back to November of 2018 and trying to get kids into this stable learning environment. And so we've been spending all week working on that and we've received some pretty positive feedback. I know there are some parents and kids who are just chomping at the bit to get to that deep, you know, critical thinking that they've been waiting for and, and we promise them we'll, we'll get there. John, what's SEL? Social emotional learning? Yes, thank you. So what we've also found is we have an increased amount of ARIES communication and also broadening our, our staff strengths when um, we're trying to communicate, communicate through Zoom and Google. Now, as mentioned before, there are some challenges. 
you know, as a, as a parent myself with multiple platforms and now at the secondary level where they could be using um, not just Edge Annuity, but possibly using UC Scout, that there is an increase in communication. And multiply that times six, and obviously, you know, it could be an overload. And so just being sure that we have very concrete structure for communication. For example, we're going to use Aries Communication for grade reporting general announcements. We're going to use Google Classroom for day-to-day -day instruction. We could use Edgenuity if we decide for weekly progress reports that go out to parents, mm -hmm. right? But being very structured in that communication because one of the things we heard last spring was that folks were, were overloaded. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna work on that. And as we mentioned, it is a steep learning curve. I, I said this a few times in our, during our PD introductions though, we have fantastic staff who have accessed these platforms before and we relied on them on August 5th, 6th, 12th, and 13th to teach their peers. Rather than bringing in people from outside who don't really know our audience and don't know our system and don't know our needs, um, we had our own, our own teaching our own. And it was, it was fantastically done, but it's, you know, it needs to be continuing. We did include as a challenge, you know, there are a lot of kids who, who come to school for the academic um, level of learning, and there are quite a few kids who come to school for other reasons as well. And we need to continue to provide hope for those kids, that there are ways to connect, there are ways to communicate. Um, Superintendent Staley and Assistant Superintendent Marchant received a fantastic idea from a student today to create a student group to work with each other, advised by one of our staff members to support their own online learning, and that came from a kid. So if we can do more of that, I think we'll continue to provide, provide hope for kids. I think, you know, maybe at this point we should um, maybe let that person speak since you've pretty much introduced the topic. Um, we have Summer who is, who had turned in a card to speak, and I wondered if she was available to, maybe she was the only one who turned in a card to speak if she would want to speak about that right now since you introduced the topic. Can we Hi. do that? <laughs> is this you, Summer? Yeah, this is me. Can everybody hear me? I was having audio troubles like earlier, but is it okay now? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay, so for those of you who don't know me, um, I am a sophomore at Chico High School and I'm enrolled, um, not at Oak Ridge, I'm enrolled at Chico High through their distance learning program. And basically my idea, um, as I've said, I've already actually like discussed it with Mr. Marchant as well as um, Ms. LeBlanc, who was kind enough to send me a video about some information. She's the wellness counselor at both PV and Chico High. So pretty much the idea um, is to get a group of students together, um, making sure that it's a holistic review of, uh, like a really comprehensive review of all the students who go to um, the school, like for example, just take Chico High as, as, as an example. And um, when I say holistic, I, I truly mean holistic, like from underrepresented groups, um, people of color to um, like people who have been on varsity football for like three years or to people who are like in theater, like every student from every walks of life, walk of life should get a say and should have a voice. And when we support each other through this way, it definitely makes students' lives easier because they know that their voice, their opinion is going to be heard. And it definitely just creates like a safe, warm kind of like feeling to know that somebody hears you and your voice is really important, which obviously is true for everyone. And I've actually uh, set up a meeting with Ms. LeBlanc, who again is the wellness counselor at the high schools. And I'm actually meeting with her on Friday to uh, discuss like future steps to be taken. But if you guys have like any questions, I know like this may seem like a little confusing, but if you guys have any questions, I would, um, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, uh, do any of the board members have questions? I'm, I'm sorry, we can't hear you, Tom. My understanding is we're not supposed to engage with speakers during this portion. No, this is not during, um, uh, that's, that's not the session that we're in. We're not in items from the floor. We are on a particular um, uh, agenda item, so you can. 
I just want to add that um, Ms. Sun has been a, a wonderful asset to our district in the past. She was our Chinese translator every time we had Chinese students come onto our campuses. Um, so um, she is very, she's fluent in Chinese and her uh, uh, family is very supportive of that program for us. So she's been amazing on our campuses with that too. So she's being very humble very not right now, but she is an amazing young lady. Well, I think this opens the door for uh, other, you know, I, I think one of the biggest things that we can do is form these type of groups on campuses. You know, there is going to be this sense of isolation and disconnect because students are not going to be able to be together as much as they would like. And uh, so we need to have a way to find out, you know, how, wh what's going on, how, how this is all working for them. Um, that was one of our, our main objectives that we identified at our last meeting, is that we wanna find out socially, emotionally, how kids are being affected by this uh, new type of learning. We're hoping that it's not gonna last very long, but while we do have it, we want to you know, make sure that we're doing all that we can. And it sounds like, uh, Summer, you've come Summer. up with a really great idea that we would like to see. So I'm glad that you've connected with uh, Mr. Marchant and Mr. Shepard. And I hope that Mr. Williams is brought into this too, correct? Mm -hmm. And um, Yep, Chico High Admin's aware. They are involved in an email string today. And, and just to reinforce that we do have a process. It was, it was um, described to kids during web and uh, link crew. They're getting so much information, you know, it may have gone right past them. Yeah. But the activities directors will make sure kids know they can still form groups. They just need an advisor and a few kids and, and they're off and running. And we want to have feedback about how uh, students are feeling about all of this that's going on and how it can be improved mm -hmm. because yes. they're experiencing it and we want to know, <laughs> you know, yeah. we want to do all Absolutely. that we can. I also, um, it's interesting, there was uh, a few interviews in the paper today of the students who are coming to Chico State even though the classes are online and even though they only can have one person in a room and what was stated was they wanted to have that experience in this case of leaving home and coming to college but we're trying to help students uh, recreate the experience they would have normally had in high school as much as we can so I just really am uh, a very thankful for her um, communication with us, but also that admin is um, openly and actively looking at this as a process. So, yep. thank you. And summer is definitely not an example of the last bullet, maintaining an awareness of slow acclimatization. She's ready to rock and roll right now, but we do have some kids that are still trying to figure out, you know, what school is all about and definitely being aware of the length of our, our structured elements, you know, our Zoom sessions, the overall day when ingenuity academic type of um, curriculum kicks in next week to be aware that there's an additional load, not only academic load, but technological load for those kids and to be aware of that as well. It's not just gonna be opening up a textbook and you know, anywhere they are, there's gonna be some significant um, impacts. We need to be sure we're aware of that and be ready for that. Okay, our last slide, thank you for being pitched as we go through this, is our targeted stu student population group. And for Chico Unified, that's our foster and homeless, our special education, and our African-American students. So I'm gonna have um, Ms. Diane Olson talk about the first three bullets about special education, then I'm gonna pass it off to John. Diane, are you available? Uh-oh, wait a minute. Mr. Hamlin's on it. There you go, I'm unmuted now, sorry about that. Takes a second for that to happen. Can you hear me okay? Yes. 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 Okay, so um, in special ed, um, this has been uh, quite a, a little ride for us. Uh, right now we are in the process of um, taking and identifying students that would qualify for appointment-based um, services. 
um, based on the guidance that um, Butte County Behave for uh, Public Health and the CDE is putting out. And as we approve the students that uh, cannot access online due to their disability, we are going to be starting um, appointment-based services as soon as we have all those approvals. And we expect those approvals to come through this week. However, we have been told that a couple times, so that may be um, hopeful thinking, but I really think we have everything in place to start that pretty quickly here. We also have some appointment-based assessments and online assessments and therapy have been enhanced so that students have better access to their providers um, in the online model. These are um, online therapy models that have been in existence for quite a while. We never had to access them in the past, but during this COVID time, I have um, gotten connections with companies that have done this um, for a long time and utilizing their platforms for our occupational therapists, our speech therapists, our psychologists, those that have a therapy type, a therapeutic type uh, model of delivery. Um, in doing this and making this happen, I've worked closely with our nurses. Uh, in fact, we have another meeting tomorrow to make sure that we have all the safety precautions and all of the um, uh, personal protection equipment in place so that it is safe for those parents who would like to access the service. Um, I have just as many parents that would like to access the service as those that are saying, no, I'm just going to stay online for now because online um, they are really protecting themselves from exposure to COVID. Um, so for all of those things, we are moving ahead and making sure we have all the compliance issues in place. Thank you, Diane. John? Yeah, so we'd just like to talk really quickly to the, to the board, the community. We have not lost sight of a, a major focus for us this year on um, equity and bias and racism in the Chico Unified School District. So while we've had our hands full with other things, um, a focus on those three has not dissipated. And an example of that is an equity alliance model pilot that's happening at Bidwell. Matter of fact, they're meeting tonight. Administration is meeting with some parents and students to develop basically a roadmap to address equitable alliances within their own school. And if you remember back a few board meetings ago, we talked about the students of color programs at Chico State and how we're trying to develop a cascading mentoring program from the college to the high school, and we really wanted to get all the way down to middle school and elementary. And the next step has taken place. Um, Principal McKay is working with Chico State to develop the next cascade, the mentoring w between the high school kids and the middle school kids. One product of the pilot will be, and I'm speaking probably way too soon, but they're wrapping their mind around the development of a um, Our Story video project that will be directed and produced by the, the PV House of Blue to document students of color within the Chico Unified School District. So. We'll be, we hope we'll be able to bring that back to the board at a future meeting. We do want to reinforce that we are still planning to focus on bias during the district-wide staff development day on September 15th. We'll have a panel of community members of color to openly and candidly discuss their, their stories and their students' stories. So we'll be working on that on September 15th. Right now, it's, I th we realize that the social emotional capacity of our students is spread out over so many different things. We felt like we needed to provide some support. So we hired additional wellness counselors. Last year, we only had, those, we only had them available to high school, and now they're available to all the secondary schools. We added some additional targeted case managers. And I think as importantly, we are directly connected through a liaison, Ritesh Kanji, to our fostering the homeless youth. Uh, Ritesh is a longtime uh, Chico Unified employee. He recently received his admin credential uh, from Chico State, and he is ready to, to support those targeted student populations. So there are some challenges, just to briefly go through those. Like with any other uh, shift, 
we, the guidance that's been coming to us from different organizations, uh, we've been having to, to dance around and figure out exactly what we're going to do, but we feel like uh, we have a pretty solid plan. Who knows what could happen tomorrow? Diane, do you want to talk about IEP services? Hi. On the challenges for um, special ed uh, providing services, we really have slow developing guidance from CDE and from Butte County Public Health, and it's it really from public health at the state level about the guidance on how to deliver services to targeted populations. So this is an ongoing issue, and I've been working closely with um, uh, our own FELPA and with our attorneys to make sure that we're following all guidance as it's um, delivered. The other thing is IEP services and the online model are a challenge to not only to deliver, but to set up the scheduling so that we aren't pulling students for the, from the limited amount of hours of um, services and instruction they're getting with the general education staff. Our staff, though, saying that that's a challenge They've been amazing in reaching out to the general ed teachers and to their site administration to make sure that services are delivered. So that's all I have to do on that to so go on to the next bullet. All right, thanks, Diane. So the third bullet, th there's tons of research out there displaying a disproportionate struggle for students of color, and especially students using online learning platforms. So that ties right back up to one of our successes. We do have a plan in place to get people together on September 15th, but more importantly, it's a plan in place to address what. And the what right now is our students of color who could be disproportionately struggling academically. Uh, that's definitely a purpose for that September 15th district-wide staff development day. Mm -hmm. So we know we're gonna be focusing on that. And then lastly, just ensuring that we have consistent communication with our targeted student populations. And again, that, that goes back through um, our foster and homeless, our special ed, and our African-American students. And specifically, we know we have kids who are can'ts. They can't access the technology. They have, a, uh, they have a different level of ability, or they don't have a stable environment, so they can't. We also have the won'ts. They do have what they need, and they just don't want to. And so how do we address those students? How do we ensure that, or do our best to engage them give them reasons to Zoom, give them reasons to, to, to come to school virtually every day. So trying to address those different, those two camps of kids. Very good. That's the end of our presentation. I just want to again thank um, our directors who have done an amazing job along with our teacher populations that have been working through us throughout the summer and our unions and the work of our um, working together to make sure that the school year started. So it's been an amazing journey. Um, we had all the lightning and thunder the first day, and then the <laughs> third day we get um, a lot of fires going on with, with ash mm. coming down everywhere. So uh, um, we, it's an amazing uh, transition that we're going through right now on, on getting our school started. And I'm just gonna jump in here and add We've heard a lot of the uh, efforts that are going forth, really hard work by people across the board. But with that said, I have to recognize that I think we all want to be back with students. We know that this yes. is far from ideal, uh, but it yes. is where we legally are at the moment. And so thank you to everyone and their efforts to make it work. And as I'll go over in the next item, under a fairly short time frame. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes. all of this said, we do know that there are holes. Okay, so before we move on to that next item. No, not anybody that is not pre um, signed up already. Okay, okay, because we're going to, we will shortly move on to the next item. Um, just one other point that um, I want to make, and that is, you know, one of the the biggest issues is the isolation and the socialization. And, you know, you were just talking about the high school students and 
you know, we, we, we got some feedback um, from Summer, but with the elementary students, you know, trying to find ways, um, now we've heard about in other, in other states, uh, and, and this is something that the school administration did not do itself, but parents have taken it upon themselves to form little learning groups, which they've called pods, and uh, so, say for example, in the kindergarten, um, in which my grandson is, uh, there would be, say, three parents who feel comfortable uh, where in, you know, they would have one week, all three children would meet in one parent's house to have their lessons in the morning, and then the next week they'd go to it another parent in the third week. So they would rotate that sort of thing so that the, the students can have that time together, but then they also, afterwards, they can play and they can, you know, horse around and, and do whatever. So, you know, enabling parents, I think, to make the connections with other parents. What can we do to help make that happen so that kids are not isolated? And, you know, maybe grand grandparents maybe who are you know, doing this with their kids, or maybe a different relative, or whatever, they can get together with others. So I was just thinking, how, how can we make that happen? That would be something that uh, we could probably facilitate if, if there was a way that, say, in the uh, classrooms, if people wanted to get connected, we could share the names. You know, like if, if I wanted to get connected, I could say to the teacher, I would like to find other people, put me in touch, you know, you can share my name with other people who want to do it, and then you could sort that out. Not that we're setting it up. Not that we take the responsibility or the liability that might happen from doing that, but just to help those parents, you know, because like say in kindergarten, you don't know any of those other parents usually, and maybe in other classes it's the same thing. Uh, teenagers at high schools, they can do it themselves. They sort themselves into their own group, but, you know, for the younger kids, um, just making that so that their socialization doesn't suffer from the isolation of mostly doing this kind of work at home individually. We can also certainly reach out to our PTAs or PTOs and for them to start setting up. They have, um, especially on our elementary, they have pretty strong groups that could possibly push something out through their Facebook pages on the, along that line. Yeah. Yeah, I think we should we should we should develop a, a process for doing that and uh, to help enable the parents because it is something to reach out. You know, maybe maybe some people are connected, but a lot of people aren't connected with other people, and it's a whole new experience. And uh, just even going to the kindergarten little uh, welcoming event that they had, where each child came and saw the teacher for ten minutes. You know, you could see in passing other parents, <laughs> but you couldn't really, you know, connect up and find a way to get together with them. So, you know, finding some way to do that would really be helpful, I think. Yeah, Eileen. Yes, thank you, Liz. Along the same line, I was contacted um, during this time leading up to the start of school by someone who does not themselves have students, but has a background with um, education and teaching and said, you know, I have time how do I help? And I, uh, Ted, getting connected with the, uh, the PTA uh, people to let them know that there may be volunteers out there if, uh, you know, we have a way of, of siphoning them into the process because there are people who recognize, as we all do, that, you know, people need help. Yeah, I just want to recognize Mr. Lando did bring the, up the idea of the pods at our last board meeting. And it is something that um, certainly we are talking about. There are some legal constraints in terms of uh, the ability to give out uh, parent information and definitely student information. So it is something we're looking at doing, but we wanna make sure we do it safely. Uh, the last thing you wanna do is ever put a child in a situation where it may not be safe. And we certainly hope that would never be the case within our community, but we mm -hmm. need to make sure that however that communication gets shared, it, it does go through uh, a parent organization or a non-school organization. Right. Yeah, and the other thing is, um, you know, we've, just to follow up what you said, Eileen, we have had reading pals um, on many of our campuses, and those people, you know, that is evidence of how many people are out there willing to volunteer 
to help kids, and uh, they've pretty much been sidelined because of this. Uh, I know they're they're trying to gear up, and I'm not really sure how they're going to manage things this year, but um, there are certainly a lot of people who are willing to volunteer for that program. Actually, Liz, they are communicating, and we are going to be trying to do Zoom reading pals <laughs> in the very okay. near future. Actually, we're meeting with Michelle and kind of starting to plan for that and try to put that in place. Yeah, so Excellent. there's people out there. This is a community that has a lot of retired teachers, <laughs> and they're, they're very helpful. Um, okay, with that being said, and if there are no uh, people that are in the queue to be recognized with hands raised to address this item, uh, as said before, this it was a information item only, and so we're not going to take a vote on anything, but we are going to uh, certainly consider everything that was discussed and, and work further to make uh, the online learning be a successful experience. Okay, so we are going to move to our next item, which is 8.1.2, and this is a uh, discussion, possibly an action item, for the Butte County Public Health Department's elementary school waiver application process, and we will find out about that. Okay, well, I will kick off 8.1.2, which is the uh, elementary waiver process, and I will say this is definitely an area of high interest. I have had a lot of emails covering almost every imaginable side of this uh, waiver process. So uh, what Mr. Sullivan and I would like to do is we would like to uh, go through and tell you, first of all, just give some uh, a background of all of the changes and the actions that unified school districts have faced since the school closures to give this some perspective. And then uh, Mr. Sullivan will take you through the actual elementary waiver process. And then we have put together some draft next steps that we would like to present to the board and get input from the board and our community on those draft next steps. <coughs> so if we could go to the, um, it's the uh, timeline of events. Okay. So I think we're all very well, uh, well aware of on March 19th was when the governor announced the closure of all in-person instruction for schools across the state. Then on, uh, we spent all summer thinking about, okay, how, hopefully this is gonna go away, it's going to be life as normal, we're gonna have kids back in school. And then uh, we really saw a spike over the course of the summer. And that made us take a step back and say, all right, we may not be able to go back to life as we knew it before. The instruction that we've been trained to do, what um, our parents know. And um, sure enough, we, uh, you know, we were in stage two, and then uh, on July 15th, the board really looked at the, the circumstances we were facing, considered a lot of um, different situations, a lot of different input, and then made the decision to allow us to go to stage two, which would be opening in person, but um, in an AMPM model, where we would really reduce the number of students on campus and in classes at any given time. Of course, as luck would have it, then on July 17th, Governor Newsom announced that all counties on the COVID-19 state monitoring list must begin the school year in a distance learning format. And then on July 25th, very shortly thereafter, Butte County was, paid, was placed on the COVID-19 monitoring list. So we had to do a very quick pivot um, right that very next Monday we started saying, okay, it's clear now, we're not going to be able to open in a modified traditional manner. We are gonna to have to focus on online learning, recognizing we are now weeks away from school starting. Then on um, August 3rd, the California Department of Public Health released the uh, in-person waiver application and reopening plan, which uh, states that you have to go through your local health organization or the county. On August 5th, and actually it was the morning of August 6th, we received the Butte County Health Department, uh, their waiver application and reopening plan criteria. And we are staring down right at the opening of school now on April 13th, was the end of summer break for our certificated staff. So we had a very short time period. They were back on Thursday and Friday, and then kids were back on Monday. So we spent two days of very intensive training, making sure that our staff was uh, ready to do online instruction. That was our focus, 
and we also added an additional day during the summer where teachers could be paid to come back and get uh, additional training in online instruction. On um, August 13th, as you can see, the hits just keep coming here. Uh, the Butte County Health Department held a press conference and stated that Butte County had officially surpassed the 200 out of 100 citizens threshold. They had 200 cases of identified COVID out of um, 100,000 uh, population. population in the, in our county. And so what that meant is that then there could be no waivers. They would not approve any waivers in, in that setting. And then very quick turnaround, we have the first day of school for students, which was three days ago on Monday. So there has been a lot packed in uh, to the summer months. Uh, that said, we have taken a look at the waiver and Ted's gonna walk you through the waiver process. Kelly, I'd like to point out in that uh, timeline there that Butte County did not get its official count corrected until uh, basically this week. And so uh, even while we were being uh, placed officially on the list and then passing the threshold, that wasn't even an accurate count. So that's also been a confounding part. Yes, there's uh, certainly the been issues with data. So to walk through some of the, uh, well, these steps really with moving us towards a waiver, if that's what we would like to do, one of them is uh, Superintendent Staley shared, we, we've had about two weeks to look at this and start kind of processing through it. Um, one of the first steps, and we're on hold with this obviously with the condition of the county, as Superintendent Staley shared, but we can start looking at some of the other elements of the waiver process. One of them for Superintendent Staley with board blessing to even get to the point of looking to submit a waiver one of the first things we have to start doing is getting community input from the school site level to kind of look and see what their interest is, engaging that interest from school site level or district level as well. So we've been talking about ways that we can survey and meet with different community groups at the site levels and how we might do that with them. Second step is actually working with employee groups and getting input from those employee groups as well. Uh, same process, we, we want to start surveying, getting input from them initially, but also having some meetings with them to talk about what that looks like and how that would work with those kinds of things. Uh, I think one of the most complex parts of it would actually be putting a plan together, developing that plan. And in the application process, there's a whole bunch of parts of what are the things that have to be included in that plan. And it's everything from specific directions on how we clean and disinfect areas, to how we cohort students and track some of those cohorts of students if something were to happen. We have to talk about how we're gonna address um, entrance, egress, and movement within the school and have, actually have specific plans written for those things. We address face coverings and other essential protective gear. We have to talk about how we will perform health screenings with students and staff in that plan. We have to talk about healthy hygiene practices and how we're gonna have hand washing stations available, some of those kinds of things as well. We also have to address identification and tracing of contacts. And this is something that we would be taking on also. Right now it's not set up for us to be doing it, it's more of the county that does that. This, with us, uh, if we choose to apply for a plan, that becomes something that we have a plan to do and to follow up on. Hmm. I'm sorry. Ted, can you help me out with what is the backup here? This. What document you're looking to have? I think it's a, I'm sorry, it's a link within the, within it, Kevin. Yeah, we've got, yeah. This one right here? Next one down. One more. Sorry about that. I was talking too fast. Thank you. So those are all, let Kevin scroll down there. That's the actual, Kevin, what Kevin just scrolled through was the actual application, which is a very simple one page overview. And the, pages he's scrolling through now, those are actually the information we would provide as far as how we worked and consulted with different groups, the parent groups and the employee groups. And as Kevin keeps going down, this right here is what we're talking about. This is the elements that have to be incorporated into that plan. So he was talking before about cleaning, disinfecting, cohorting students, plan for entrance and egress of it, face coverings, health screenings, how we do those kinds of things, healthy hygiene practices, identification and tracing of contacts. Mm. And as I mentioned, this is 
Right now, this is something the county has taken on, but if we choose to move forward with a waiver, this is something that we have to have incorporated in our plan as far as how we will be addressing those things as well. Uh, Dr. Kaiser? Yes, I know of a high school where they opened on Monday as well, and now they already have three students um, who are positive, and they wouldn't have known if the grandparent hadn't posted on Facebook. Uh, apparently, the family lawyer told them that they didn't have to tell the school. So how can we do that when, in fact, they don't have to tell us? How can we identify and trace student contacts? Yeah, when they don't have to tell us the kids got it or somebody in the family got I, it. I think uh, we, we start facing if students are um, having a fever or so, is displaying some of those um, symptoms of it, then that gives us that in, information that we need to start looking at that and talking with the family and, and following up with some tracing also. Uh, short of that, I'm not sure how we else we know those things. We continue to be notified of positive cases by Butte County right. Health Department. They share that. So well, we'd that also did, that was a that didn't happen in this case. I mean, the teachers didn't know they had a student in their class that had was that in Butte positive. County. Pardon? Was that in Butte County? Yes, same. So we would also have to have a plan in place for physical distancing with staff and students and the routines to make sure that's happening. We certainly would want and need to have staff training and family education as far as what the plan includes and how it's going to be operating. Testing of students and staff, I think is what maybe you were referring to, Dr. Kaiser, a little bit of how do we kind of have a plan in place to keep track of some of that information if we need to. Uh, part of the plan has to include a trigger to switch back to distance learning if certain conditions are happening with certain levels of uh, positive testing. And also, how are we going to communicate that plan? <coughs> So I think for us to kind of go through all of those things, that becomes part of almost like the negotiation process. And that's what we'd be not only just consulting, but actually walking through with our employee groups to come up with something that both sides would feel that is going to be reasonable and work well for these situations. I don't know if Mr. Hanlon wants to address that at all. I think that's a good segue for the um, consultation part. So under the terms of the waiver, um, we're required to consult with our employee groups uh, in regards to the issues that are outlined in the in the waiver. Um, I checked with our legal, and there's actually a definition for what consultation is, because it's different than negotiations or meet, uh, meet and confer, or those things that we're more commonly uh, aware of. So the definition is the employer must consider proposals, but not bound to attempt in good faith to reach a negotiated settlement. So it's an attempt to reach out to the employee groups, get input from them, work with them on um, an understanding um, and, and their viewpoints, their concerns, um, hear them out and, and have those con conversations. Um, we're, we would be required to consult with both groups um, and part of that consultation might be the surveys that um, Mr. Sullivan discussed earlier, but also in-depth conversations about what concerns and um, that they may have on behalf of the, their, their members. Um, the next step then would, of course, be uh, if a waiver were adopted by the school board, we would have to enter into negotiations with regards to the impact and effects um, on working conditions. And those are always negotiable, things like safety, face masks, sanitation, things we have talked about before, but under uh, a waiver, um, the conditions would be different than under an online learning model. Um, the daily schedule, what would that look like? Uh, start and end time, how much time of instruction, do we do AM, PM, is it every other day? It's kind of similar to the things we talked about earlier when we were talking about the hybrid model. And then transfer rights um, would be another example. What if not the whole staff did not want to work under this model? Um, what would be the transfer rights away from that school site and or, and or back to that school site when we go back into stage four and we get under normal circumstances? So there's things that we would, we would be required to negotiate um, with, with those uh, union groups um, in order to uh, determine those things. Yes, yeah, Kathy. I understand also that this is, these are, um, when we were talking about how fast things have changed for us when we look at this timeline, but my understanding is any kind of agreement waiver uh, can be uh, changed by a 14-day event, i.e., we have 
enough students in a particular group or uh, teachers or staff that have to be isolated or quarantined. And so um, that you could be, you could have a waiver, have school start, get positive cases and have to flip back to online learning. This high school that I was talking about, mm -hmm. the teachers are already expecting, I mean, in three days they have three cases um, that they might be flipped back into online learning. And so what happens when things are that potentially short-term or, or time-controlled that is outside of our framework or reference? That, that yeah. Kathy, is actually one of the conditions in oh. there. They specifically talk about a trigger for switching back to distance learning, oh. and that will be incorporated in as part of that plan. So if that trigger gets hit, you have to make that shift. What's your plan to okay. be able to do that? And, and the health department also has the right to usurp that and, um, and trigger us back in because of conditions in the county right. um, that may be outside the school, that particular, right. particular school site. So there are things that can, can reverse that quickly. Okay, Jim, I think uh, Eileen has a question. I do, thank you. Either Ted or Jim, whichever one of you wants to tackle us, because uh, <clears throat> these last three boxes are where my questions are because of something that we just talked about in the, um, the HIPAA uh, disclosure rules and the, um, the lag time between testing and uh, the test results coming back that period of you know one to five days where a student hasn't tested positive so they are not being restricted by the parent mm -hmm. probably and are continuing to come and so on the testing of students and staff is what this is asking is that we determine um, what we're going to do to ensure that um, the tests happen? Do, do, does the school district set up those guidelines? Or are there guidelines that the county is putting in front of us to follow? We've been very fortunate in, uh, we've had a very good cooperative relationship in developing guidelines by working with Butte County Public Health. Mm -hmm. However, this is moving some of that onus onto us. What are we going to do to ensure that those students get tested? So if all of those conditions were able to be worked through, ironed out, um, Superintendent Staley w would be able to come back to the school board and share that that's something that was interested and with those conditions met, we could be moving forward with a waiver at that point if that was the will of the board and Superintendent Staley was supporting that. So my question would be, is it an all or nothing deal? Could you, you know, and I, I don't know how this works for the union because in my mind, I don't see how it would be possible for some schools to uh, ha get a waiver and other schools not to because the union, if, you know, how would, I just don't know how that would work. Um, Jim, do you know, have you ever asked them about that? If, it, if a possibility of some schools, if some schools wanted to pursue this because, you know, we have uh, been hearing that maybe some teachers at some schools are amenable to going back and mm -hmm. they would want one of these. Yes. So, so let me jump in here. And um, we do have Kevin Reddy, who is the president of the Chico Unified Teachers Association. I have asked him to join the Zoom so that oh, he can okay. answer some of the questions. Oh. But what I would like to do first is um, we really thought about what would be some logical next steps that we could take in moving forward toward the waiver process? And what we realized in going through that is that a lot of the steps that we would be taking are very similar to the steps that we're going to be taking as we get ready to negotiate and look forward to a stage two reopening. Mm -hmm. So right. if you can open, Kevin, uh, the one that is next steps on the agenda. Oh. There you go. So step one, and this is all a draft, we're looking forward to input from both the board and the community on this. But step one would be, um, we would the district office would assist each TK through five school site, all of our elementary school sites, in um, doing a, a survey. And that survey would need to go out to certificated staff, classified staff, 
parents and guardians, and then it also has to go out to community groups operating on the campus, and that would be your school site council, your English language uh, learner advisory council, your PTAs, card if the school has a card program, and reading pals. And then we would bring those surveys back and share that information with the board at their September 16th board meeting. We would be looking for trends within that, and we would disaggregate this information, obviously, by school site. Our uh, third step, would actually be occurring and is occurring um, at the same time. And that's where I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Hanlon and Mr. Moretti to uh, go ahead and go through that. Could you just go back to two? Because somehow I missed what two was. Two was sharing the survey data oh, with sharing. bringing okay, that back to Sorry. our board and our community in yeah. a public setting. Okay. So step three, Mr. Hanlon and Mr. Moretti, if you're available. Yeah, so um, I was, um, part of that is that we were talking about working conditions and those are going to be completely negotiable and those are going to, those are going to be things that we're going to have to come to agreement with. We have reached agreements with both units, um, as I've discussed before, on August 7th with CUTA and then um, as late as August 17th, which was, it went to affect the very first day of school with CSEA. Um, so we would have those conversations um, regarding, um, regarding working conditions, conditions as I've um, talked about. So um, we do have a uh, negotiation set up with CUTA um, starting on September 10th and then again on the 23rd. Um, we have yet to determine negotiation meetings with CSEA, um, but I'm sure they're anxious to get back to the table also. So I'm going to um, unmute Mr. Moretti. I am unmuted. You are. You're in. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. So, so the issues we would have to do, I, I think Liz brought this up. What if some teachers want to do it and some teachers don't? So let's say we're 50, 50, like, like the country is. So we have half our schools open and half our schools have, let me rephrase, half our teachers want to do it and half don't. We would, we would want to negotiate language for transfer, which Jim mentioned earlier. And I, I would imagine parents would also be in that 50-50 split and would want to have their kids either in it or not in it. So we would have to negotiate language of how that would work. So how would half our teachers move to schools that were doing it and half stay at, in those kids? So let's just, we have 12 elementary schools, let's pretend it goes in half. And then we would have to no, negotiate language about how would, would we go back if we went into stage two. So would we go to the distance learning piece while we're in stage one for the half that want it and the half that don't, and then rearrange everybody when we go into stage two in a distance learning? And I don't have an answer to that question, but I know that has to be negotiated. Additionally, are we gonna be asked to negotiate what might happen if the county allows transfers before we negotiate what will happen when we go into stage two. So it's a priority uh, type of question that I don't have an answer to. There's only so many days that we can negotiate. Uh, the, the union's negotiating team are full-time teachers. And so for them to negotiate, they have to get substitutes and, and move away from what they're doing right now. And I imagine that the district's negotiating team is just as busy trying to get what's done. So to to put one step in front of the other, I, I have concerns about that because we we know we will go into stage two at some point and it would benefit us to have that language in the contract to to allow that to happen when it happens. So it's a it's a cart and horse deal as I look at it of, of what we're gonna do first. Kevin, my concern would be if we did something where we said we would move staff, teachers, staff, and the 14-day thing hit us where we had to close again back to online. That would appear to be a tremendous amount of mm -hmm. change that could be going on for the rest of the school year. I mean, I hate to think of that, but uh, I, the context I of, concern. you know, yeah. scary. It would be very disruptive. One thing I want to add on what Kevin said is, is about um, negotiations. We we have um, in the last several years have been uh, negotiating two full days per month, which if you look traditionally in in the district is um, quite frequent. 
Um, again, like, like um, Kevin said, is it's difficult to pull teachers out of the classroom for a full day and with a sub, it has great impacts on, on the, on the uh, students, but at the same time, we need to come to agreements on things too. But uh, two days a month is, is fairly frequent um, by traditional standard, historical standards. Yes, I'm sorry, Eileen. Yes, thank you. Um, on the same lines as Dr. Kaiser was just talking as I'm looking at that issue that um, you and Kevin have talked about um, is the, you know which, which cart first and which horse first. And it, to me, does not make sense to, um, to go with um, trying to take a look at the waiver process that is um, in no way certain, as we've said, about as far as timeline. Um, and one of the major things that we discussed when we, <clears throat> back on the 15th, when we set up our AMPM <coughs> model and what to do about going into stage two was the importance of keeping the cohorts of these students together. I mean, we're already dealing with the social emotional impact of um, what's going on with the kids and to, to keep them together with the same teacher and the same classmates, even if it is Zoom, is important. And if you're, if, if you're increasing the possibility of removing that cohort um, and separating them several times during the year, from my perspective, that is, is just very opposite of what we're trying to do in establishing some stability for our students and our parents, um, and, well, and our teachers, my goodness. Uh, how do you suddenly have to get to know, you know, uh, say you've got uh, 23 kids and you've got half of them, and then you suddenly don't have half of them, but you have a different half, you go through that process all over again. I do not like that. That is, that is not appealing to me. Um, I do believe that we need to, to prepare for going into stage two and continuing to hope to high heaven that this state keeps its masks on and its social distancing in place and we're able to get to a point where we can be moved off of the, the um, restricted list and get back to in-person AM, PM model as we have already um, selected um, with some stability. I do not like adding more uncertainty to what we're trying to prepare for our kids. So, so if I can, um, let me go back through the, or just go through, finish going through the steps that we had outlined, and then by all means, we uh, want to hear from our community, we wanna hear from our board as to whether or not that we're going in the right direction, or if there's changes we need to make. But we are legally obligated to negotiate working conditions. And um, you know, there, there is some symmetry here in that as we are negotiating for stage two, some of that likely will have overlaps with potential waiver language or negotiations as well. So then we would bring back to the board on September 16th, as we do at every board meeting, and a negotiations update. How are we progressing uh, in regards to our negotiations? Upon completion of the negotiations, the district and the school reopening plans would be presented to the board for approval. Upon approval by the board, I would submit the waiver and the reopening plans to Butte County Public Health, and then Butte County Public Health has up to 14 days to review the plan. Uh, I do know that they are really looking through those very carefully, and they have uh, returned them to many of the ones that have already submitted and asked for clarification. Once they feel comfortable, then they too are consulting with the California Department of Health as to whether to uh, approve or deny the application. So those were the steps that we came up with um, as a draft plan for our elementary waiver. So with that, I will turn it back over to the board for questions, discussions, and um, comments from our public. And I do believe we have speaker cards on this item. Yeah, we do. Okay, yes, Kathy. Um, so if we go back to those steps, 
uh, so five, we complete negotiations, and um, then six, uh, you would submit the waiver application and the reopening plans. Um, so that's a month from now, basically. And as you said, there have already been some, uh, very few, but some elementary schools in the county who have submitted uh, requests, uh, waiver requests. Um, is there any feedback loop so uh, other school districts get information about why a particular waiver uh, got sent back by the county health department? Or, I mean, are we gonna have something to learn from in this month? Yes, I do have copies and they, and they are available to the public on the Butte County Public Health website of the waivers that have been submitted. To, uh, so far, with the exception of Gridley, um, and I, my understanding is they are still you know, doing some back and forth on the information that they need. Uh, Gridley Unified is the only unified school district that has submitted a waiver. I am sure there will be more coming, but at this point, uh, Gridley is the only one that has. The others are small private schools and uh, charter schools that have submitted. Has any been approved? Uh, I do not know the answer to that. I did ask for one that was a, um, you know, a really good sample that we could look at. And you know, the one that we were given is obviously a much smaller, it's a school of 36 students. Oh. So that's gonna be very different than what we would be doing for uh, our elementary school population that has 6,000 students. So in other words, you're not getting feedback about what might cause a rejection at this point. I will say that Butte County Public Health has been very good to work with, and I think you know if we ask questions, we get phone calls you know immediately back. So I, I don't anticipate problems at all in working with them, but I think like us and like the rest of the state, they too are working through this process. You know, it, it's all very new. Yeah. Thank you. So. Part of this was, in, and this was to my surprise, I hadn't heard of this before, was the responsibility for us to do tracking. Yes. How, how would that be possible? How do you think that would be possible? Well, I think those are things that we have to research. And again, um, you know, we look at how other, I have no problem looking with how, at how other districts up and down the state are handling these issues. We would work with Butte County Public Health uh, we have a much more advanced document than many counties, as was already mentioned, in the uh, tracing the information that Butte County Public Health has put together, the flow chart. Mm. Uh, but it would—it's it, obviously an area that we will have to address. That's sort of just like not in our realm of expertise. Yeah, and it's not in our wheelhouse to have to do that. Uh, so you know, I mean, who we'd have to hire some a whole new staff to do that sort of thing. Um, I mean, I, I'm just trying to envision how that would be, how that would be even be possible. Um, okay, uh, uh, board members, did you, did any of you have any more comments or at this point we, we could open up the, the comments. Um, we will open up the comments to the people who submitted comment cards and we will take them one by one. And um, just to reiterate, each person will have three minutes to speak and uh, you will be warned when your time is coming close to ending. So um, we can proceed with that. Okay, so we had um, five people sign up with comment cards and four are online. So the first one up is, and then we have a couple other ones that have uh, put their hands up. Okay. But so we'll go through the ones that had pre-signed up. The first one up is Matt Tennis. Matt, if you're on, cheer up. Hi there. Uh, I'm, my name is Matt Tennis, and uh, I am the, I guess, creator and head of an organization called the Chico Parents for In-Person Learning. Started it up uh, last Sunday, and as of Monday, we had 200 members. Uh, by today, that number has grown to 250. And um, I guess I represent the people who don't think things are going that great in Chico Unified right now. Um, uh, member Lando, I have kind of a special kinship with you because I, I know that you actually are a parent of a child at Chico Unified. I myself am the parent of three children who are in the Chico Unified system and one who will be. Uh, and they are, with the exception of one who's in junior high, they are all grade school uh, material. And I'm here to tell you today 
that for a working family where both parents work, I myself have an essential job and my wife owns her own business, but for working parents who've got kids who are in elementary school, um, we are in meltdown mode right now and it's a horrible situation. And the product that you're describing that, this, that, that, that you guys are all so excited about, I'm here to tell you that we don't want that product. The idea of sitting around at home with our kids um, for hours and hours at a time, it is several hours a day. Let us be completely clear by the time we add in the time they're expected to be on a Zoom call and then the time that they are spending doing their assignments, they are on the computer for several hours a day. Uh, we have horror stories like crazy pouring into uh, my mailbox. Uh, one of my favorites is a child who participated in a Zoom call from inside uh, his father's pickup truck because they couldn't get childcare for that day. Um, how do you grade a child uh, who's in that situation? How do you give them a grade? No, I think it's a really bad situation. You guys should get on this waiver thing as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, next up, Mr. Hanlon. Okay, the next speaker is James Bishop. James, are you on? Can you hear me okay? I oh, I heard myself. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I think things have become clear recently, um, and that mainly as a result of some very clear CDC guidelines that were released. Um, they basically, in their testimony before Congress and in other formats, have um, shown real quantifiable harm, both physical and psychological, that have been done to students that is going to accelerate dramatically, quoting them, if schools don't reopen in face for face-to-face -face education in the fall. Um, this is set up against a speculative harm uh, that we're all familiar with. It's, I think we would all admit, is extremely vague as to what it all means. I want to make some of that a little more clear, if I can. Uh, first of all, children are much less likely to um, to face any kind of actual physical risk. I'm not talking about whether they test positive for COVID. I'm talking about them getting sick or dying. That is much less likely, um, surprisingly perhaps, uh, with COVID than it has been with the seasonal flu. Um, this is not a controversial idea. If you're shocked by it, please, I implore you, <laughs> please go and do your research and find out for yourself. This is just a byproduct of the data. There's, there's no real arguing with it. So there's the other issue of whether children are vectors for the disease for other people to get sick. Um, and in that regard, um, there's also a lot of data and research that has been done. Um, one, of, one of the important sources of data is contact tracing. And it has been stated many times and uh, by different people, uh, the famous one, I guess, was the World Health Organization that said that they can't find um, contact tracing data to support the idea that children are vectors for disease they describe children as being very rare. Um, they also describe asymptomatic cases as being very rare. And I suspect that the two are linked. Um, children are typically asymptomatic when they do get sick. And for that reason, it's not surprising that they aren't vectors for disease. But at any rate, for whatever the reason is, that's what the data shows. And it shouldn't really be surprising also because the whole coronavirus family is known to not um, be transmitted readily by um, asymptomatic people. And so there's, should, you know, how much data do we need to support something that we could have expected based on the family history of the disease? So it's kind of mind boggling to me, and I imagine it must be to a lot of people, if you, as you dig into the data, it becomes more and more bizarre. It's just, you cannot understand all of this, everything you guys have just been talking about, all this bureaucracy and everything that we're gonna like, and it's, it's hard to understand what's going on, but I would offer one, possibility, and that comes from the LA County Teachers Union, they said that they will not allow students to return to face-to-face -face learning, no matter what harm they may be suffering. They will not allow them unless we defund the police, close all charter schools. I see my time is... Um, Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Thank you for contributing. Okay, the next speaker is Becky Conkin. Becky? You're up. Oh, hang on. <laughs> my phone's having a meltdown. Is my mic open? You might want to turn my mic Can't off. Can't you turn it off yourself? I don't think so. I'm sure they'll get to it. 
Becky Conkin, are you are you on? I don't know if you should have attacked the teacher's union, but fair enough. Becky, where's Becky? Hey there. Hello, I'm here. Can you okay, hear we can hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, hi, my name's Becky Conkin. Um, I'm the mom of four school-aged children. I also work part-time as a pediatric nurse practitioner. My intention in speaking this evening is really to stress the importance of our school district in applying for an elementary waiver for in-person learning on campus. As it stands now, our tax-funded public school classrooms are being inhabited by daycare organizations who are supervising, mask-wearing, socially distanced children who are plugged into computers for distance learning. This particular scenario has been deemed completely safe by our county health department. While I fully understand the health and physical risk and implications of COVID-19 on school-aged children, my purpose tonight is not to defend why I believe it is safe for kids to be on campus. Um, we already have a designated qualified health officer at our Department of Health that has the expertise to determine when the time is appropriate and safe to return to school. But my driving motivation tonight is to respectfully urge the school board to get the ball rolling by preparing and submitting a waiver to provide elementary in-person learning to our health department. So when that time is deemed, deemed the right time, we'll be prepared and ready for that moment. As a parent, I'm advocating for the social, emotional, and mental well-being of my children along with the children of our community. Time is of the essence and quality education has to be our priority. Pretending that rigorous distance learning is an adequate substitution for in-person learning is absolute denial. Those families who have found it superior by all means can opt to continue their education from home. But those who rely on it, value and believe in the traditional classroom education system must rise up and fight to return to our campuses. Every single public service industry has had to create new systems, had to adapt and learn how they'll coexist with a virus in midst of a pandemic. Teachers, administrators, school board, I believe in your ability to really dig deep, be creative, and develop a plan to safely bring back our kids to school where only the best learning takes place. Thanks, guys. Okay, thank you. We'll hear our next speaker. Did uh, What happened to number three on the list? That she is not, um, she's not online. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. I'll just cross that off. So the next one is Salo Londano. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hi. All right. Awesome. Great. Hi, I'm a parent of two, one of which is currently a kindergarten student at Neo Dow. Um, I am a, a member of uh, the Chico Parents for In-Person Learning. And um, I believe I speak for a lot of parents when I say that I understand View County Public Health's position on this. Um, I may not agree with it, uh, the whole you know 200 cases per 100,000 or whatever. I feel like that, uh, that standard, that threshold is probably going to change with time anyway. But I also see no reason why that, their position at the county level should preclude the Chico Unified School Board from instructing staff to send the application in immediately, uh, just like 10 other schools and districts in Butte County have already done. Um, just because public health isn't accepting applications doesn't mean they're not receiving them and working with districts and schools to improve the reopening plans. If the board waits until public health begins accepting applications in order to send hours, we will be weeks, if not a month behind the schedule. It's a fact that the board has already had their reopening plan ready to go for weeks. Um, in fact, the board voted to go back to partial school under those safety measures under the AMPN plan. So why wait? Apply now. If the board doesn't move to apply now, parents need to be asking the question why? What's stopping the board from doing it? If there's an issue with collective bargaining, then we need, we need to hear this. Parents deserve to know the truth. As your attorney already mentioned, a consultation is a good faith conversation. No group has veto power over this process. Safety measures proposed for the AMPM model are already approved and it was only and it was voted on by this board. 
it's time to move forward with the waiver and negotiate with uh, labor for stage two reopening while our kids are already learning in person. Uh, nothing has changed since that vote for the AMPM model other than the governor adding us to some kind of watch list. And the, gov the governor's his office has also specifically urged districts to apply for this waiver because of what the scientific data says about kids and COVID. And the negative consequences of these kids not going back to school. If it's open, I'm gonna send you. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Telling parents to wait. Telling parents to wait weeks or month for the district to survey sites and negotiate with labor when it's not required is really unacceptable. It's a delay tactic and it's something that parents in Chico will take note of. The mental and emotional health of our children is at stake here, guys. What we've heard for the past hours are all the reasons why we can't do this. It's too complicated. Thank you. Total Your time lack is of up. Optimism and leadership on this is pretty depressing. So okay. please, our kids need it. Thank you for your comments. Okay, do we have um, anyone else in the queue? So we have three more. Okay, um, we have already gone past our time limit. It's up to the board um, as to whether they want to continue to listen to more comments. Yes? Tim, Tim is it possible to remute the people who've already spoken? I think we're getting some. Uh, I did. Okay, thank you. Sorry um, hope, hopefully, I can keep up with it, but I okay. think I remute. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, yes. Um, Eileen? Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, I uh, would support allowing the last three people in the queue to be heard. Um, the, uh, I think the importance of, of the decision that not only we're facing, but what they're facing in the way of, uh, you know, supporting what has to happen or not in the district, um, I'd like to hear what the others have to say. Would you like to make a motion? I, I move that we extend the, uh, the time another um, 12 minutes, 12, no, three times, three, nine minutes, excuse me. I was not a math major um, and allow the last three speakers in the queue to be heard. I'll okay, the, do we have a second? Yes. Okay, Tom uh, has seconded. So Eileen made a motion to extend this for another three speakers, which is almost equivalent to 10 minutes. And it was a second by Mr. Lando. Uh, we will take a vote. Uh, Linda, how do you say? Linda says yes. Eileen, obviously you made the motion, so. Yes, Robinson, I. <laughs> okay, Griffin, I. Lando, I. All righty, so we will hear the last three speakers. Um, go ahead, Mr. Hanlon. Okay, the next speaker is Crosby. Crosby, you're up. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Appreciate the opportunity to speak and for you guys uh, opening that up. Um, so uh, my name is Ryan Crosby. I'm a dad. I have three kids, uh, school age kids currently in the Chico system. Um, I'm, I'm a member of the Chico Parents for in-person learning. And really, I, I want to just express my interest in moving forward with the waiver. Um, and I think it's something that we need to do. We need to get in front of, we need to get this in front of uh, the county health boards so that they can take a look at it. Uh, we can always create issues and we can we can really kind of think out and, and view into the future and see you know, like uh, these are the things we're going to face. Um, but reality is, is we don't know what those are until we get to that space. And so a couple of things that I wanted to address that I've heard already is, um, you know, the keeping the cohort together. Right. And I got to tell you, there is no community on Zoom. Um, the experience I had today with one of my sons, he was in a class. Um, and the and the kids realized that they could um, all jump on the mic at once and start to yell into the mic. And the teacher had no recourse. Maybe she didn't realize how to use Zoom or or whatever. But in the end, what happened was is they just they just she just shut down the whole program. So the class just in, ended. And I asked him, I said, well, "What are you doing?" And uh, he said, "Well, the class just ended ended because all the kids were screaming into the mic, um, and so the teacher just left. Right? And so." The reality of it is, is there is no community. There's no, there's nothing to keep together. There's no cohort to get, keep together. Uh, earlier, we heard uh, one of the members talk about, uh, you know, some of the teachers may not want to come to in-person learning, um, and, and some of the teachers would want to. It's about 50-50, and they, and and you guys were assuming that maybe the the public would be at the same space. Well, that actually works out perfectly, right? Uh, 
well, why don't we put those teachers that want to stay in the virtual environment and those kids and students who want to stay into that in that virtual environment together and then and then have the teachers that are willing to come and do the in-person learning and those students that are willing to come and do the in-person uh, learning be in a class together as well um, I think I think ultimately if that's the way it works out it actually works out really really well so ultimately uh, what our objective is is to educate our kids uh, that's the whole reason why the schools exist it's not for supervision it's not for food programs I know that we've it's it's ex, it's expanded into those areas but the primary objective of the school is to educate our kids and frankly the way it's being done isn't working right um, and so I move I, I, I implore you guys uh, to let's get this waiver going let's get it in front of people and let's not belabor this uh, let's just start putting one foot in front of the other and moving forward. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. We'll hear our next speaker. Okay, the next speaker is Patty L. Patty L, you're on. Patty, you should be unmuted. mute now okay can you hear me we, we can okay awesome so my number one thing is um i know it's a struggle what we're going through i have an 18 year employee with chico unified and i have nine grand grandchildren right now in chico unified so well actually two of them are in italy one of the highest um uh, in, anyway, so um, my concern is several things. Number one, connectivity, $5.3 billion that Gavin Newsom has designated to um, connectivity for our students. And our Chico Unified um, district um, voted for computers for all of our teachers, which I admit they need, definitely. But when our parents are asked to provide extra connectivity for our students, I think um, some of that $5.3 billion needs to go to those parents who need those that extra connectivity. Um, the what, no, uh, Number two, the um, I worked in special ed for several years and um, I agree that they need that extra help. African-Americans, Three of my grandchildren are Afri African American and of color. How does that apply to kid, um, the application of what we need to apply to every one of our students? Um, I just want to applore this community to um, acknowledge the frustrations of everyone, our, our parents, our working parents who are trying to struggle to figure out how to make this all happen. Um, lack of communication that has transpired. Uh, why, you know, we had, we as um, a, an employee got our, all of our parents who had to, um, comply with online learning in a district in 24 hours 
And why has it taken three months for our school district to make this happen? Patty, I'm sorry, but your time has elapsed. Thank you for participating. I, I do want to make sure, Jim, that we don't have Amanda Moncado because she did submit a, a speaker card. I will check again. She was not. Been, she has not been on to this point. But let me check. What was that no, she's still not online. Okay. Amanda Moncado, Moncada. So, did submit a speaker card, so I, I right, want to yeah. make sure we heard from someone that submitted a speaker card. Yeah. So the next one, had her, the last one that had their hand up yes, was Lisa the last one. Vargas. Mm -hmm. Lisa Vargas. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I am a parent of two children at Little Chico Creek who attend special day class. Um, I really just wanted to convey to the group that um, my children and children of special needs um, across the group that I'm a part of, the um, um, autism group of Butte County, um, I'm not sure if it's for everyone, but in my particular case, um, my children would definitely benefit from in-person instruction, um, considering that they utilize not just special day class, but occupational therapy, speech therapy services, the multiple therapeutic um, services that are provided by um, the school. Um, during this time, while we've been uh, doing online instruction, my children have not been able to attend to any of the process. It's been incredibly difficult, um, a complete struggle, and very frustrating for my husband and I um, to try to take on the role as teachers when um, neither one of us are. Um, during this time, both of my children have had to go through multiple medications to help and um, sort of ward off some of the uh, some of the things that have sort of happened over time from them not attending school. My boys love going to school and just the uh, process of waiting for the school bus to arrive in the morning to um, getting to school and getting on the school bus to go home every day um, was a pure joy for them. Um, that's something that no longer exists in their daily life and that has taken an immense toll on their mental health capacities. Um, one of my children in particular, he um, engages in self-injurious behavior, um, which has increased um, exponentially by not having the opportunity to be in school. Um, meeting with the teachers on Monday for our meet and greet was uh, rather solemn. Um, getting to spend less than 10 minutes and watching my son um, his eyes while he looked completely um, excited to see his teacher after so long, but not being allowed to roam around the classroom, not understanding why his paraeducators were keeping him from um, even walking into the classroom. He was only allowed to stand within the front door of that classroom was heartbreaking. Um, this whole process has been heartbreaking for our family. My boys really would benefit mostly from being in school. They need to be in school and their mental health has been affected immensely. Um, we do have to see a psychiatrist on a regular basis now because of the inability to control their behaviors. We also see it out in the community because of the lack of education that they're receiving. Um, I basically just wanted to, to mention lastly, um, to keep this short that the request that we were given by his special education day teacher by both um, special education day teachers was to log on every day, keep the computer on, and even if they weren't attending, make sure that the computer stayed on for the allotted time um, that my boys were supposed to be uh, attending to the computer, which again is another heartbreaking situation because both of them do suffer from ADHD, Lisa? which doesn't... Uh, Lisa, yes. I'm sorry, I, I have to stop you because your time has elapsed. But yes, thank you, thank you for contributing. We appreciate your your calling in and and waiting to uh, share your views. We appreciate that. Thank you, President thank you. Griffin. Um, CUTA President Kevin Brady is requesting a last word. Oh, 
ready? Okay. Kevin Brady, you're up. Are you there, Kevin? Oh, there we go. I'm sorry. It wouldn't let me unmute, Jim. <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to reiterate to some of the folks that we are negotiating what the hybrid model would look like. And, and it, it comes back to, it's really repeating what I've said before. So people said, you know, if you need to negotiate this, negotiate this now. Well, what do we negotiate first? Do we negotiate what it looks like in a hybrid model? Or do we negotiate what it looks like with a waiver when the county isn't approving waivers? And, and to address some of the issues that many of the parents have brought up, which are totally reasonable, it's not working for Lisa Vargas. It's not working for your kids as good as in, in school education would. And no one is arguing that with you. No one is saying that this is for the, if, if online education worked best for you, you'd already be in it. The people that are not in it prior to this situation, that was for a reason. This isn't something that teachers are picking. They want to be back in school. But it comes back to, I think it was Saul who said, well, let's just do half and half. Half the schools do it and half don't. Well, half the parents don't want to do it, and they're all mixed up in those half of the other schools. So you're gonna, it's going to create an incredible situation that we would have to deal with that, that we can, but is that what you want to do first? And, and I'll end with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Okay, so at this point, um, we need to talk about if we want to um, go through the next steps. Um, the next steps have been laid out here. Um, possibly take the first step, which would be uh, finding out, you know, is this, we, we've heard from a few parents tonight. We've certainly heard from numerous parents through emails. Um, but you know, w this is an item that uh, we can choose to take an action or not take an action. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be going forward with the waiver, but it could be taking a step that is necessary uh, in that process. So yes, Kathy. So um, I, I would have to say that People listening and, and maybe looking at this are, are already in an emotional situation and stress, which I think any of us who are dealing with kids are, are very aware of that ourselves. But the framework of it is that we can't just skip over the steps. We have to do them all or it won't even be, it would just be a waste of paper. Um, so I do think the way it was laid out um, by our administration is that there is a structure here that we can utilize that would be preparing for the waiver um, and at the same time uh, preparing to be able to go to the AMPM model that we voted for when we come off the monitoring list. So I, I saw that as it is two processes, but they seem to be melded together for much of the time. I do, though, want very strongly um, for people to realize that you can't jump through time in this process. Um, the surveys will have to be designed and take time to both pass out and get the information back and uh, handle the statistics. The, the negotiations with staff and teachers will be the same. It will take time to consider that. So really, nobody's talking, I hope, uh, about someone thinking that we can send it off next week. 
Um, the timeline I saw looked like maybe in a month we could have it all put together. And that was going to take a lot of effort from everyone to get that done. Um, I see literally no advantage to trying to short change this because that will get us rejected out of hand. So anyway, that's my input. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Tom? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Two comments I'd like to make. One, um, that I hear many of the parents just saying that they wish that we would acknowledge how frustrating it is. And I hope, I think Kevin did that. And I think I would just like to, on behalf of the board, if I'm not being too forward, let those listeners know that we do. We understand this is not perfect, and we are continually trying to improve the way that we deliver services to kids. This uh, conversation is certainly a part of that, but we know this is not perfect, and we are doing everything we can to increase the way we reach and teach and serve these students. Um, secondly, because it is such a laborious process, I think that several of these speakers had a very good point. I will come right out and say that I understand we are over that 200 per 100,000 limit, and we're not gonna get a waiver right now. Given the amount of time it takes, I think that beginning the process of applying for the waiver immediately, just so we have it in our, in our back pocket. Step six is it comes back to us for approval before Kelly sends, Ms. Daly sends it off. Um, I see absolutely no downside to beginning the process as quickly as possible. And if it comes to the point where it's ready and we decide it's not a good idea, we still have that option. But I would advocate for giving ourselves more choices <coughs> rather than less by beginning the process as quickly as possible. Okay, yes, Eileen. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I, question of, of uh, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, Jim, right now in our negotiations process with our labor groups, we are negotiating the um, impacts of the AMPM model, correct? We will be on our next meeting. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so we have, we have begun um, uh, to move forward as quickly as possible, given the scheduling and how that, that stuff works out, to make sure that when we do get below the guidelines, we've got the 14 days below the guidelines, and the department has said, okay, you can move back into in-person schooling. We have been working on the best model for doing that, which is what we've approved uh, pending negotiations is the AMPM model, which gives everybody what they want, which is to get their kids back in front of their teachers and for the teachers to be in front of their kids. To interrupt that process and you know cut it its attention by starting on a waiver process that we have no idea if we would even be eligible for the waiver process say two weeks before we become eligible for the AMPM in-person process so I support keeping our focus on making sure that when we get cleared for in-person schooling, that it's the plan we hope to be able to at least go through the whole first semester of school. If we have to do the whole school year, ugly, don't want to do that. But at least we have the best possible choice for in person in place. And, and to me, to divert our attention with trying to meet all the conditions of the waiver and decide how we're gonna do tracing and tracking, and my goodness, all the other stuff that we would be required to do in order to fulfill the requirements of getting a waiver, that's an awful lot of resource um, uh, expenditure when where we need to rehab to have our resources and our attention is making the best of the one thing that we have approved wanting to do which is the AMPM model with all but the 600 families and kids that have gone to um, Oak Ridge already 
in place so that if it's November 1st or you know December 1st, we've got the plan to have the county um, clear us to do a waiver before then doesn't seem reasonable. If, if you look at all of the things that we would be required to um, develop, because we don't have this stuff in place, um, I think we're I think we're we're doing our program a disservice because what we want more than anything is to get all of those families and all of those kids that have said we want in person to get them in person. And so I don't support going after the waiver. I say charge ahead to get everybody into in person as quickly as we get cleared. Okay, Linda, would you like to speak? Hold on, I'm working on it. Thank you. I've been silenced here <laughs> from afar. I'm, I'm so uh, sorry. You know, we didn't know that. That's okay. Um, Eileen, I understand what you're, you're saying. Um, you know, there is a lot to do to apply for this waiver, but I have to actually agree with Tom and I support going forward and going through the steps as outlined, especially that parent survey. I was kind of surprised to hear, I was hoping I would hear from our speakers but I'm sure we'll get this information from the surveys for the parents. You know, what if, as Kevin Moretti's example um, put out, we have six of our 12 schools that open and say my children go to Citrus, but Citrus is not one of the six. Am I going to be willing to pull my third grader and send him to Little Chico Creek? So there's so many logistics. There's so many different things. And I think we need to cross those bridges when we get there. In the meantime, I really encourage my colleagues to consider going forward with the steps that were outlined by our administration and getting this waiver process started. That's my comment. Thank you, Linda. Okay, so mm -hmm. the way I feel about it is that um, I think this was laid out really well because it's very logical. And you have step one, which is really surveying to see how people feel, you know? Yes. If you don't have enough support, then, you know, that means you just continue. We continue with our negotiations with our labor groups, and we plan for the future of reopening, which will occur in natural course. Uh, however, if we see a huge upsurge in people wanting to do this, both on the end of teachers and uh, the community yeah. and, you know, parents, then we are at step two and we as a board can then examine those results and make a determination, do we want to move forward? I agree with you, though, um, Eileen, in that we don't want to step you know part of the step is step three is really getting set up for school period i mean you know how is it what's it going to look like and it's going to be the model that we already decided on so we we absolutely yes. have to get that negotiated first yes. because we won't be able to put on school at all until we get that negotiated so if that follows uh, you know, from after step two, then we cannot though get off track. So that is why that is number three and that those other things come later as far as you know, determining all that other um, requirements of applying for the waiver. So um, I would agree to starting the process knowing that when we get to step two, we will have another opportunity to look this over again and see how things are because this situation always is changing in time. And we know that. We don't know where we're going to be at that point. You know, if we, if we still have over 200 per 100,000, you know, it's going to look a little bit differently than it, it would if our numbers drop 
and we have significant uh, proof that, hey, things are on the downturn, downswing, and, and we, can, we can better plan. So I would also support going through this next step process um, with the knowledge that it is coming back to us after step one, and we have some feedback from our community that we can rely on. Yes, Kathy. There's another advantage to, um, to uh, doing step one, which is, um, you know, we get emails or people make comments to us or whatever, but uh, the context of the survey, since they're site specific, may indicate to us that there are some groups that are more united in their um, assessment opinion of what they want. And, um, and I'm not generating the issue that people would try to move their kids because we don't even know what and exactly. where. I think the exactly. survey would give us a landscape Yep. And that's always a critical function. Uh, I mean, we've heard from, I think we let eight people speak, but the, we have 12,000 kids and potentially, you know, I don't know, 9,000, 8,000 households. And who says parents agree? I mean, one parent may differ with another. So to me, getting surveys is like giving us a very, very, valuable mapping context in which we would better understand and our teachers and our staff. Um, one question I did have though, because I was a little bit concerned about this, uh, we say we're gonna get to um, community groups, and you can see the list right there, school site, English learner, parent teacher, car, reading pals. I don't know how many of those are literally active right now at our school sites. It, and, and so, you know, even the survey may be a way, for, we, we talk about, well, maybe parents could set up pods, but doing the survey might be a way for them to connect with one another, like, oh, now we have something real to do that might let us connect and bind with each other about what kinds of issues we see and what kind of resources we might be able to bring. So to me, that's, that's a, a potential side effect that could be very valuable. Okay, so are we at a point now where we want to vote on whether we're going to um, go forward with the next steps? Yes, Eileen? Oh, thank you, Madam President. Um, hearing from my fellow board members is always a good thing. Some um, exceptional points were made and I'm convinced that going forward with steps one leading to step two is absolutely what we need to do. Um, uh, tending to be a bit of a, of a, a pessimist with <laughs> what a, how I've seen the, this um, pandemic deteriorate in Butte County and the, the uh, different thing made me look more at the implementation of the end steps than what you fellow board members were focused on, which was the beginning of the beginning steps. And so I, I too am in support of beginning the process with step one. Okay, so that being the case, do I have a motion? I would move to direct staff to begin stage one or step one of the waiver process, yes. I'll second. Okay, Kathy um, seemed to get there first, so. <laughs> okay, you got it. Um, all right, so uh, Tom is, uh, has made the motion and Linda has seconded. And this motion is to proceed with the first steps um, of the uh, Chico Unified uh, Elementary Waiver um, but process, but I believe that it needs to be understood that what we are doing is following a very concrete plan that was uh, created by the district 
and it does have seven steps, and we would begin first with a step that involves surveying our constituents, meaning the staff, the parents, the community groups, to see how they feel about returning back to school under the waiver process and have in conveying to them what the waiver process actually is and what the ramifications of the waiver process would be because we would have to assume that they may not be fully knowledgeable about that. Yes, Eileen. Madam President, thank you. Ju just to, um, not correct, just mention that um, you stated that the um, one through seven process was um, the district's creation. It was, but it's a creation to follow the steps that are mandated by Butte County yes. um, Public Health. So I, I did wanna make that distinction that, that what we're saying we are going to follow is not something we created, it's what we said, it's what we identified as the process as outlined right. by Butte County Right, yes, but yeah, just, just so people know though that this is, this is our own document yes. and what we're agreeing to here is following this plan. Yes, yes. okay, yes, Kelly. Yeah, I do wanna clarify that uh, step three would be simultaneous with the step one. Uh, Jim already has negotiation yes. dates yes. scheduled so it, you know, it's not necessarily step one, step two, then we start to step three, step three will be ongoing. And um, our elementary school reopening plans as outlined by Butte County Public Health largely will be determined by the negotiations that happen because those are working conditions that are described and we legally have to negotiate working conditions. So that we wanna get a jump on and get going on and um, we have those dates set to do that. Right, and that, that has already started. So that's, that's correct, yeah. and that's a, a good clarification, yeah. The, the other thing too is there's a number of things we need to negotiate for the hybrid stage two model, which is the, the AMPM model, and then there's a number re, with regards to working conditions, and then there's a number of issues we have to um, negotiate for the waiver. And there's a lot of overlap between those two, not, not 100%, but um, so a lot of those issues, if they're resolved in the the, uh, the negotiations to move into stage two are going to also apply to a, to a waiver. Um, some of those things have to be discussed out, um, but um, unless we are planning in a waiver going back to normal, which I, I don't think is possible under these conditions right now, um, there's gonna be a lot of crossover between the two to new, two models. Right, and I, and I took from Kevin's statements that, Kevin Moretti's, that it was, these weren't mutually as exclusive you know, right. that doing one is basically working towards the other. And so would that would be the understanding because um, as Eileen mentioned, we wouldn't want to get diverted off of the planning for the reopening as we had envisioned to begin with. So, um, okay, so we have a motion, we have a second, and I guess it's time to vote unless there's further, any further discussion? And um, okay, so um, all those in favor, um, Linda, do you, how do you vote? Aye. Yeah. Aye, Tom? Aye. Kathy? Aye. Um, I vote aye. Robinson, aye. Okay, so we are going to move forward with uh, the next steps. And um, I'm sure that probably this will go on our website somewhere. And uh, that way the public will be aware of Erica what Blanc. process we are following and as it, as it does progress. Okay, thank you everybody for working through that and thank you for all the people who participated in the discussion um, on the Zoom. Okay, we do have a few more items left on our agenda. The next one happens to be business services and it is the approval of Butte County Air Quality Management District and Carl Moyer program funding for bus replacement. Yes, we brought these to you uh, previously. We've purchased two electric vehicle buses at this point. This is actually for a type two bus for our special needs students. So it is a four, over a $400,000 bus. 
The grant will pay $400,000 of it, so we estimate the cost to the district to be about $15,000. We believe we can pay for that within the current transportation budget. Um, and so our recommendation is that um, the board would give us approval to move forward with this grant application. I did the math on this. It's like we're paying 3.7%. So I move approval of uh, the bus purchase. Thank you. Alrighty, a motion by Dr. Kaiser, a second by Eileen Robinson. Um, we, any further discussion about that? Any questions? Okay, we'll no, take. No, I'm actually in support of this. I'm just hoping we'll be able to use it for our children sooner than later. So. Yeah, yes. exactly, exactly. All right, all those in favor? Then Linda. Aye. Tom. Aye. Kathy. Aye. I vote aye. Eileen <laughs> Robinson. Aye. Okay, it is unanimous. Then we did approve that item. Thank you. Yeah, okay, next up is a discussion action item with regards to approval of a 45-day budget revision for the 2020 to 21 school year. Mr. Bultima. So typically, uh, we have not done a 45-day revised budget to the board in a number of years, and frankly, that's because the budget that was adopted by the state was very similar um, and did not really present any material differences in the budget that the school district adopted, mainly because the governor um, had a lot of authority and power, and the budget that he put forward uh, was largely supported at the legislative level. Um, however, we find ourselves in a different position, and we do have some very large material differences. So. This is the timeline for budget development. Uh, you are very um, much aware that that process starts early in January. And we've just added that now we have this additional 45-day budget revision that we're bringing to you. I would also take this opportunity to let the board know this is a much different format than you've seen historically for our budgets. Previously, we run those budgets through the standardized accounting code structure software. But the 45-day budget revision does not require that the budget be presented in the SACS software. And this template that uh, we provided the budget report in is from Butte County Office of Education, is used countywide. So we're gonna, this is only six slides, so I'm not gonna walk you through our typical, you know, 15, almost 20, this is very quick. But bottom line is this is what the budget looked like in May. And really the, the major piece of this is that we had a 10% cut to our funding, mm -hmm. which was over $9 million of lost revenue ongoing. Mm -hmm. And then you cut to really what was adopted. Um, we didn't get the cost of living adjustments, so we didn't get an increase, but the state budget promised us to receive the same amount we received in the prior year based on the base grant amounts. Now, the percentage of the unduplicated students or targeted students has changed somewhat, so it may move up or down slightly, but not significantly by any means. And we'll talk more about this at the end, uh, but cash deferrals is a major, um, instrument that the state is attempting to use to balance the budget at their level. So here's the picture of what our multi-year projection looked like at original budget, and as a reminder, we knew this was bad <laughs> when we adopted it because of the timing in which we had to take action at the local level and knowing the state budget was adopted shortly after, and frankly, it was a car wreck, right? I mean, you lose $9.6 million year every year ongoing, you find that we're basically upside down over $18 million. Mm -hmm. And reminder, we did have a budget uh, for the public. <laughs> we did have a budget that had um, projected uh, cuts to our budget um, and other spending freezes and things that we could do to get at least more in line. But frankly, really impossible to take that kind of a cut and still operate a school district. So this is the uh, same budget um, based on a 45 day. And you can see, and I just want the board to focus in on the net increase decrease, we still have a deficit that is flowing through this budget, but is more, that is more representative of our operating deficit um, than really anything caused by a loss in the revenue per se, okay? What 
also changes is all the revenue amounts in reserve, I mean all re revenue, all the fund balance reserve amounts are intact. So we're able to maintain the 3% requirement from the state, your 2% board re uh, reserve, the additional one-time board reserve dollars from 2018-19. We have the um, one-time dollars from 17, 18, 19, 20, and then the reserves for stores and cash and those types of things that are non-spendable. So even after three years, with this budget of being flat, we still have a positive change in the third year, but it's only $687,000. And the only other thing I'll say is, in a situation where we have flat funding, we will run a deficit because of the cost of, in this case, PERS and STRS, even though they were reduced in the current year, they increase in that third year. And just to keep the lights on, PG&E, fuel, and costs like that, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars of increase to a budget that's one, you know, $150 million. So in a situation where we have flat funding, we're gonna drive deficits. That's why these reserve amounts, you can see at um, estimated actual for the 1920 year at $25 million is so important because it allows us to basically deal with this. And it's not like we're gonna sit back and just not do anything, but it gives us a little bit of time. Okay. So this is an important slide, I think, and you're gonna start seeing this again. Some of you that were on the board back in 2008 and 2009, mm -hmm. you knew that we watched cash very closely. Uh, we moved into a position where a lot of our budget reports were all about cash, because basically it's once you run out of cash that you become fiscally insolvent. So this is a really, um, over the last five years, one, two, three, four, well, four years, um, this is our cash by month. And you can see that we usually start in July with a fairly high dollar amount, and then we burn those, that, those cash dollars over the first part of the year. And then we see this very large increase in December. Well, that's because that's when we receive property taxes. So all the cash gets put back into the treasury through property taxes, and then we start spending those dollars down again. And it, if you're like me, you wonder, how come my ending balance from one year didn't become my beginning cash balance in the next year? Well, that's because you're talking about June 30th and then July 30th. So there's 30 days between those numbers, so they're not perfectly ending balance, beginning balance type number. Okay, that's really the report. And uh, it's a very simplified report. You'll notice um, from the template that's been provided. We did a, um, also include some reports directly out of our financial system, um, which is, I think for you as a board would know that we can generate financial reports very quickly and at a high level of accuracy. Mm -hmm. And they really support documents for Butte County Office of Education. With that said, I would uh, request the board's approval to submit this to Butte County Office of Education. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Do you have any questions for Kevin? Linda, do you have any questions? No, I don't have any questions, but I want to um, just again commend our fiscal services team for staying on top of things. This budget looks a lot better <laughs> than uh, what we had seen earlier. So um, yeah, thank you. And I would like to move approval if there's no further discussion. Okay. I'll second that, but I'll also point out that currently there is a coin shortage across the United States, so maybe we should get out on the street and see if we can get some quarters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a motion by Linda Hovey. I have a second by, I mean, a second by Dr. Kaiser. Um, are there any other questions or comments from people before we vote? Okay, um, all those in favor, Linda? Aye. Tom? Aye. Kathy? Aye. Griffin, aye. Robinson, I. All right, that is uh, unanimously approved. Okay, next on our agenda is human resources, and that would be <coughs> Mr. Hanlon. Okay, this should be quick. Um, so as you know, I intermittently bring to you um, positions that are no longer needed uh, to eliminate. These are not layoffs, even though the title um, says so. Um, there is no one in these positions, but we have two positions that we uh, would like to eliminate, one at Parkview and one at um, PV. That's through resolution 1527-20. I move resolution 1527-20. Second. 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 Okay, motion by Dr. <coughs> Kaiser, second by Eileen Robinson. Anything further to talk about here? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, that's unanimous. 
Okay, and then the next one is resolution 1528-20. These are parent classroom aides, um, both at Little Chico Creek. They, um, they, these positions are not currently filled. They want to use the funds for uh, school aides, yard, yard supervision. So they're just transferring the funds and opening <coughs> a, a different position. So again, no one is laid off. Um, these are empty positions. Okay. Someone want to make a motion? I'll move 1528-20. Yard supervision. I'll second the motion. Um, I'm sorry, I just... Uh, yeah, who are the supervisors? That's a good question. These will not be filled until kids are back, but they want to have them filled and ready to go. They're typically parents um, of children at the... Well, they are. They're, they're, they have children at the school site, so they'll return when their kids return. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that was a, That's good a good question. question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so I'm sorry. We had a motion by Dr. Kaiser. We had a second by Eileen Robinson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, that passes unanimously as well. Um, next up is another opportunity for items from the floor. This is items not currently on this agenda tonight. Are there any hands in the audience? So it is, it's a speaker that has already spoken, so. Do they understand it can't be about Do they understand it cannot be about something that we've already discussed? Okay, um, I see that, um, uh, Patty, you have your hand up. Um, just to remind you that um, items from the floor are, have to pertain to items that are not on the agenda. So um, if you'd like to bring something up that isn't on the agenda, you may have three minutes. Uh, okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, so I'm just curious about the agenda on the campuses. Um, how does that relate to anything that's going on right now? Um, what agenda on the campuses? I'm not what, following you. About, um, the agendas of uh, having students on campuses and all of that. Uh, could you elaborate you on that a little bit? Question, what, 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 were you, what you were just talking about, um, right, right, like two minutes before that, um, how, do, how does that apply? Oh, okay. Oh, the, what, what, um, what Mr. Lando was talking about was we had a uh, uh, human resource action on the agenda which was there was a there were two positions at one of our schools where it was a parent aid position and the school chose to not have that be parent aid positions those were no longer needed so they wanted to switch over and use the funding to have campus uh, supervision I think it is for play oh, uh -huh. for the playground and so they're allowed to do that, but Mr. Lando's question is, who are they going to supervise because nobody is on campus right now? Well, so there is people on campus. There's staff students and there's card students on campus. And there is um, teachers who only need to be on um, campus for three hours a day, which is understandable. And then um, there um, classified staff who are with them are um, uh, supposed to, if there's no um, work for them while they're on campus, go to other campuses to find out what's, uh, where they are needed. And that's not transpiring because teachers are going home, not every teacher, some teachers are working immense hours a day and other teachers are going home at three hours a day and possibly carrying on their um, extra hours that they're supposed to be uh, com completing. 
but the classified staff are going home and not completing their duties while other classified staff are working their full hours. So I'm just trying to understand why those classified staff aren't being utilized to uh, accommodate the uh, uh, programs that are going on at the campuses right now. Okay, I think you might have misunderstood what this item was about. Um, each year we review the staffing at our sites and sometimes there are staff that are no longer necessary because they might be specific to certain pupils where there might be aids, instructional aids or whatever, and if those students are no longer there, they no longer need those aids, we don't have a reason to have that position any longer. And so it'll come before the board to eliminate that position. In this case, this, the school decided that they wanted to utilize, instead of having an aid, they wanted to utilize a person on the campus who was going to watch the kids and supervise them when they had their play periods, when they have recess. So that had, this has nothing to do with supervision of employees or what employees are doing or where they're going or how long they're staying. It didn't have anything to do with that. So um, anyhow, well, I, that's, no, that's, 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 that's really confusing what you just said because I totally understand the, the, the staff classification and where people are being employed because classified staff Okay, I'm right sorry, now, but you know what? This what this whole this, to, this, um, this whole discussion chosen? this whole discussion is actually inappropriate because for one thing, why, it was, why it was, is it inappropriate? Because because it's an agenda, ma'am. Being chosen, to it was an agenda act. item. It was an agenda item, and this is items from the floor which pertains to things which are not agenda items. And I'm not even supposed to be having a discussion with you on items from the floor. So. I muted, I muted. Patty, if you want to give uh, classified HR a call tomorrow, we'd be more than happy to walk you through this. Okay. Okay, well, um, that was um, the last item on our agenda, other than if there are any further announcements. Linda, did you have your hand up? No, I do not have you one. You do not, okay. All right, well, if that's the case, then I think we've come to the end of our meeting and I will call it adjourned. <laughs>